thanks for waking up so early. Um, so this is the whoa. I'm loud. Uh, this is the workshop about deploying and scaling application in containers using Docker and its open source orchestration things. Um, so if you are here for another workshop, you still have the time to make a run for the exit and find the right workshop. Um, I was told to let you know that we should be kind to the Wi-Fi, but apparently it's not a thing anymore. It's OK. Um, everything should be fixed with the Wi-Fi today. But still, those things uh, still stand. Um, normally, you should see a 2.4G and a 5G network. Try to use the 5G network. Don't use your hotspot. Uh, and if you're bored, don't stream videos from YouTube or Netflix. Just like look on your local content instead. Um, I'm also asked to tell you that there is a link uh, with um, like a survey. And so I will put the link um, at the end of the workshop uh, so that you can see it. Um, there will be a break around 10, 15, 10, 30. Did I do something wrong? Um, there will be lunch at 12, 20. So food will be upstairs. Those who have requested a kosher meal should let a server know. There will be separate buffet stations for vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, and halal meals. And we have placed as much power as we could afford on the tables. Please share the outlets. Outlets could be in your and you or the row in front of you, just like um, ex safety exits in, in the plane. Um, and that's pretty much it for the housekeeping notes. Yes? OK, I will, um, I will speak up a little bit until we can um, fix that up. Um, so, <coughs> well, actually, that's the new microphone, so. I, do you want to remove all of it or just try to switch the... We push to production a little bit too fast. This looks like this might work. Awesome. All right. Um, so I'm Jerome, and uh, my TA is on the back of the room there, AJ. Uh, so when you have questions or problems and issues, um, she can help as well. Um, this is our collective Docker knowledge. There was an awesome keynote, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, in Montreal at PyCon by Jacob Kiplan Moss, when he was explaining that there are no rock stars at one end of the spectrum and like complete beginners at the other end. Uh, the knowledge is spread more like this as a bell curve. Like most of us do okay. Uh, some of us have more experience and do great. And some of us just got started and do a little bit less great. Uh, so what I will do during the, during the break, um, I will make a kind of temperature check and ask you who thinks we're going too fast or too slow. I will use that to adjust the pace. And um, statistically, there will always be a few hands saying, well, this is too fast, a few hands telling this is too slow. So my goal is to pair together those people so that the ones that are super comfortable with the content can maybe lend a, lend a hand to the ones that are less comfortable with the content. The agenda, uh, so th this will be almost three and a half hours of content. It is rather fast paced because I try to show many things uh, and give you all the content so that you can review it afterwards rather than going too slow and having many people being like, well, I didn't learn much here. So if you think that things are going fast, don't panic. Uh, first, I will give you an opportunity for myself to slow down at the, at the break. And all the content that you will see here is available online in a GitHub repo. So not only these slides, but also the demo app that we will use, uh, the code samples, uh, scripts, even the, the scripts that I use to deploy the, the things around the workshop are available online. So you can do this own workshop if you want. Uh, you are even encouraged to do so. There will be a coffee break around 10.30. 
Uh, if by 10.40 I still haven't done the coffee break, then throw rotten tomatoes or something like that at me because sometimes I tend to forget about these things. Uh, feel free to interrupt with questions at any time. This is not a huge audience, so it's fine to raise hands, ask questions at any time. Uh, and if you wonder, well, should I really ask that question? I'm not so sure. Um, are people going to think that maybe I didn't understand or whatever? Uh, you can ask, that's always okay, because usually if you wonder about something I said, you're not the only person wondering so. And if you're too shy to raise your hand, you can even use um, a, a chat room that we have. I will give the link in a few slides. Uh, it's, um, we're using Gitter, uh, and so it lets you ask questions there, where uh, AJ will be able to fill the questions uh, without interrupting the flow of the workshop if you're concerned about that. Um, brief introduction, so this, this content was initially written and designed to support that kind of tutorial, like in person with somebody doing demos and explaining. But then uh, we realized that human beings don't scale. Uh, so we also adapted that content so that it could be uh, used in self-paced environments, which means that uh, all the content that you see here is available in a kind of extended edition, director's cut, whatever, where you have at least 50% more slides, uh, some extra chapters, some extra details, um, and it's, it's basically the same content, but with a bunch of uh, extra slides and a few things that are replaced, and you are invited to check that out if you want to know more. Um, <coughs> So this is the table of contents for today. Uh, first, I will talk a little bit about what you need to, to, to make the most out of the workshop, which was indicated in the, uh, in, in the workshop description, but I just want to make sure that we cover that. Uh, then I will present the demo app that we are going to use during the workshop. We are going to run it on a single node. We are going to see that, surprise, surprise, this application has not been extremely well written and has performance bottlenecks, and that to solve those bottlenecks, we have to scale out. So to scale out, I will introduce SwarmKit, uh, which is Docker's native open source system to build uh, open um, distributed clusters. We will create our first Swarm, then we will run a few kind of hello world services on that cluster. Then we will deploy a local registry to store the images for our demo application. Then we will build, chip, and run the demo application, and that will give me an opportunity to explain why uh, Docker's motto is build, chip, and run. Then I will show how to integrate that with Compose to have uh, um, the uh, seam seamless, most seamless um, workflow from dev to production. I will show how to do rolling updates, uh, how to do logging metrics, and how to deal with stateful services. All right. So per requirements, uh, you don't need much for that tutorial, but you need a computer, and you need on that computer a web browser and an SSH client. So we set the bar pretty low because uh, otherwise we know how that is. If, if we tell us, well, you need to install VirtualBox and Docker and this and that, uh, half of the people will only do that the day off. Um, and then it kills the Wi-Fi, and then people spend half an hour installing VirtualBox, and it's very unfortunate for everybody. So all you need is a web browser and an SSH client. Um, during the whole tutorial, you will see uh, those gray rectangles with a little uh, squiggly thing here, which is supposed to be a keyboard. And those gray rectangles are, are the exercises, so the things that you can do hands-on. Um, everybody has different ways to learn, like some people like to read lots of documentations and then they internalize that and then they know everything and that's great. Some people need to do things by themselves, some people need to see someone do the things, for some people it's get something else. So I try to have a little bit of all of that. So I will explain how it works. I will do demos on screen, and you can do the same demos by following the instructions that are in the gray rectangles. So the first thing that we are invited to do is to go to container.training to view the slides. And if we go to container.training, um, you see a page like that, which shows uh, the vast extent of my front-end development abilities. Uh, and there are two links that are, well, all three links are actually interesting. Uh, join the conversation will take you to that chat room I was talking about. And this is using Gitter. The only thing you need to join a chat room on Gitter is a GitHub account. So here again, I, I thought it would be a, 
uh, a pretty low uh, requirement level. And you don't have to use it, but I invite you to do so. You can even leave live feedback during the tutorial if at some point you're like, oh, slide 55, that was really weird and confusing. I, I want to let those people know about it. Uh, you can do that, and that actually that would be great because that's how I iterate and improve um, the, the content uh, tutorial after tutorial. Another link that is interesting is the middle one that has the very same slides that I'm showing to you. And you can see in the bottom right corner, there is a slide number. And if you want to go to a specific slide, for example, if, if I want to catch up with here slide 8, um, I just have to edit the URL bar, and I put the slide number after the hash, and boom, it takes me to slide 8. It's not the best UI ever, but it's super convenient, and that will be useful if at some point you want to copy-paste some commands from the slides to the terminal. And then there is a last link on top, the self-paced version, which, as you can see, has even more slides. It has like 370-something slides. Um, and it's, uh, as I said, much longer version with extra details, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So since, we, since I didn't ask you to install Docker, how are we going to do Docker stuff? Well, we're going to use VMs. Uh, everybody will have a cluster of five VMs. And basically, normally, each of you should have a little paper like that. It's not taped under your chairs. It's just like on the table. Uh, if you don't have one of those little papers, please raise your hand. And then AJ will fold one in a little paper and throw it your way. Yep. Awesome. Um, so everybody gets five VMs. Uh, they were uh, deployed just this morning, just for, for this opportunity. Um, and they will remain up until tomorrow, I think. Uh, and they have been set up with Docker pre-installed and with SSH keys pre-deployed on them. So what I mean by that is that I can log on one of the VMs. So I'm going to use I, I'm going to use Mosh instead of SSH. Uh, Mosh is mobile SSH. It's exactly the same thing except that it's using UDP so that if, you, if your connection goes up and down or if, we, if you go from one connection to the other, it's going to um, not disconnect you. Um, so I, but you can use SSH, that's just fine. So I'm connecting to my first VM here. And here you should put the IP address that is on your paper, not mine. Otherwise, you are going to, um, like, one of us two will be... Now, this VM, this VM is too small for two of us, I think. Uh, that's how they say in the movies. Um, nope. That's, that's not how it's supposed to work. Um, control. Um, what did I do? Well, maybe I will use a search after all. Uh, all right. Okay, and once you're logged in, uh, you can access the other nodes by using little aliases, node 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, for instance, I can do SSH node 2, and it takes me to node 2 without having to uh, specify a password. So that will be great to automate things. Uh, just to check that everything works fine, who was able to log on their node 1 and then SSH to node 2? Who had problems with these, any of these steps? Nobody? OK, so far so good. Um, if you are redoing the workshop, you won't have these little VMs anymore. Um, but there are a bunch of other things that you can use. There is something called Play with Docker, which gives you um, Docker environments in the browser. Uh, and the scripts that I use to deploy those VMs are available in the repo with the slides and everything else, which means that if at some point you want to run a similar workshop, uh, you can use those scripts, and in like 10 to 20 minutes, you can get as many VMs as you want for uh, as large a group as you want. During the whole tutorial, we will mostly interact with Node 1. 
Um, we will sometimes SSH to the other nodes to see what's going on and do some troubleshooting, but we will mostly use node 1. Node 1 will be uh, not exactly our bastion host, because that wouldn't be the, an accurate definition, but it would be a kind of our control center for the whole cluster. We won't need to check out the code on the other nodes. We won't need to do anything specific on the other nodes. Uh, the, the SSH access that we have is mostly for debugging purposes. Sometimes I will say something like, let's open a new terminal to like, keep something running and run another command. Uh, when I say that, you can do whatever you want. You can literally open a new terminal and SSH on the machine, or you can use something like Screen or Tmux. I will personally use Tmux because it's more convenient when presenting with, with a full screen window, but you can do whatever you want. If, like me, you have uh, the memory of a goldfish and you tend to forget Tmux keyboard shortcuts, that's a cheat sheet. Don't pay attention. Um, on the VMs, we have the um, uh, very recent versions of the Docker engine of Compose and Machine. Uh, so I'm going to check that. Like if I do Docker version, it's telling me that we have Docker 1705 that was released like uh, 10 days ago. Uh, we have uh, Docker Compose 112. Uh, we have Docker Machine 011, etc., etc. Okay. So s some of you might be wondering what is this 1705 version. Out of curiosity, is anybody like being what about the 1705 version? Nobody? Great. Uh, well, because we went from a kind of uh, Semver style versioning, like 110, 111, 112, uh, 113, and 113 became 1703. So now we are using the, the same um, numbering scheme as Ubuntu, uh, where it's uh, year and month. And so every month there is an edge release, which is the equivalent of Debian Unstable, where you release, uh, release early, release often. And every quarter there is a new stable release that then trickles down to the Enterprise Edition, etc., etc. There is a graph here for people who think that this is confusing, and usually the graph helps to understand that thing, but this is just version numbering, so we don't really care too much about it. And without further ado, let's get started. So first, our demo application. Um, so the, um, we are going to head over to the, that GitHub repo here. Um, that's the, the, the famous repo that has everything. The demo app, the slides, the scripts, the, all the things. And specifically, the um, demo app will be in the Docker coins directory. In this Docker coins directory, uh, we see that we have a docker-compose.yaml file, uh, and this file is the file used by docker-compose to describe the application. If we look at that file, we can see that we have a number of services. Uh, we have five services, uh, RNG, Hasher, WebUI, Redis, and Walker. Uh, some of those services are using an image straight from the Docker Hub. For instance, the Redis service here uh, says image Redis, that means just get that image from the Docker Hub and run it. And the other services are instead um, having a build section. So they say, when you want to run the RNG service, you should build it from the directory RNG. And yep, if we look back here, we see that we have four directories, Hasher, RNG, WebUI, Walker, containing the, the source for those four services. I'm not a very original person, so I decided to use like for service foo, the directory is foo, so that it's easy to know where is everything. If we look inside one of those directories, for instance for the worker, uh, we have a Docker file, so there always has to be a Docker file that explains how to build this service. And then in the Docker file, we have some instructions uh, showing how to build the container uh, for this service. And in that case, the application is extremely simple. So each time you will have um, generally just like one uh, source file. In that case, it's a Python worker uh, with very little dependencies on external things. I think it's mostly using requests and Redis. That's it. Um, there is also a small Flask application, um, which is RNG here. Uh, and since sometimes I also talk to people who do other languages than Python, yes, it happens. Um, I also have a Ruby service here and also a Node.js service there. Um, so, right. 
Um, how do those services discover each other? Uh, that's, uh, th that part is really interesting when you start building things in containers. In traditional code, we would have uh, maybe the IP address. When you, when you want to connect to another service, we'd put the IP address or a DNS name, or you would put an environment variable, and then when you start the service, you provide the environment, or you would use uh, config values, and then you would have different configuration files for different environments. Uh, with containers, we can use um, a little trick, which is that each container will have its own view of the system, in including the outside world, which means that each container can have its own view of DNS, which means that the code can look like this. This is an actual uh, excerpt from the worker code. When it wants to connect to Redis, it just connects to the name Redis, uh, as if Redis um, resolved to an IP address, because once you run in the container, yes, it will resolve to an IP address. Same thing when I want to connect to RNG and Hasher, I put HTTP colon slash slash RNG, HTTP colon slash slash Hasher. Uh, this allows us to have uh, multiple copies of the stack running side by side. For instance, if I have uh, stack A and stack B, the same app, but let's say slightly different versions, and we're trying to do some git bisect or find out what's going on with the regression, uh, in the containers in stack A, uh, we'll have the Redis container A, and in stack B, they have Redis container B. Um, that I'm going to answer the question just after. So when you are in stack A, when you resolve the name Redis, it will give you the IP address of the container Redis A. And when you are in stack B and you resolve the name Redis, it gives you the address of the container Redis B. That way, each stack is isolated, and you don't need to change your code when you deploy stack A or stack B. Yes? Where do we set up those aliases? Um, so the, the way this works is that if we look in the um, compose file, uh, which is in Docker coins here, compose file, uh, the services have a name. Like here, services RNG. That defines the name for that service. So when I bring up this application, uh, the Compose, uh, which is a layer on top of Docker, uh, we're like, OK, so one of your services is named RNG. So the container for that service um, is going to get the RNG alias automatically. That's how it works. If, for instance, instead of RNG, I wanted it to be called like ABC, I would have to change that here. And the fact that I decided to coincide like RNG here and there, it's just like for uniformity and, and because I, I like it when things are simple and easy to remember and everything. Uh, but the, the name comes from that thing here. And if you have some specific scenarios where you want the name here to be different from the DNS name, then you can add an extra configuration thing to say network alias should be this. You can also add extra network aliases if you're so inclined. Um, there are some very specific use cases. For instance, let's say that you, some of your code is connecting to um, some API on api.service.io. You can uh, indicate an override to say, when resolving api.service.io, instead of getting the actual IP address of that thing, I want to, you to return a hard-coded IP address or the IP address of another container. So you can you know, mock some external services if you want to just by injecting DNS. Not always a good idea, but sometimes it's super useful. OK. Uh, so what exactly is this application? What does it do? Uh, it's a Docker coin miner, and uh, Docker coin is not an actual cryptocurrency. Uh, it's just something I wrote two years ago because I needed a nice demo for microservices applications, and then it kind of stayed there, and I never was able to uh, write something else. Um, and so the, the way the Docker coins demo app works is that there is a worker that is doing an infinite loop. And in this loop, it's going to generate a random number. Then it's going to compute the hash of that random number. And then it's going to increment a counter. And then it's going to repeat that. So get random, hash, increment counter. Get random, hash, increment counter. It's completely useless, but uh, it has great educational properties, as we will see. 
Um, so then we, when we look a little bit more into how it works, instead of just calling like random.random, .random, it's going to make um, uh, a request to a web service that generates random numbers. You probably should not do that in actual code, but again, educational properties. So instead of generating the random number directly, we do um, an API request to a service that only generates random numbers. That service is RNG, like random number generator. Then when we need to compute the hash, instead of using like uh, some crypto function and just computing the hash, we post the data that we want to hash to another service and the service returns the hash. That service is hasher. And then when we need to increment a counter, instead of incrementing a counter like in memory, we increment that counter in Redis. So that's why we have a Redis service. And finally, we have a web interface, web UI, which will observe that Redis counter and show us the speed at which the whole system is going. So normally we should be able to stop the whole application and go to the web UI and see how fast we're doing this silly infinite loop. So we're going to do exactly that. So first, I'm going to clone the repo. So git clone, github.com, jpetadzo, that's me, orchestration workshop. Uh, is this big enough for the last row? OK, thanks. So in this orchestration workshop repo, we see exactly what we had before on GitHub. That's great. And if I go to the Docker coins directory, I have this Docker Compose ML file. And when I see a Docker Compose ML file, uh, there is a kind of um, a muscle memory thing. I can do Docker Compose up. I'm going to do exactly that. So when I do that, Docker Compose um, passes the Docker Compose ML file. See, OK, so you have some services using an image from the Docker Hub. I'm going to pull that image, which is exactly what it's doing now, like pulling Redis. Then you have a bunch of services for which you have a build section. So I'm going to build these. Like uh, it, it built the worker first. Now it's building Hasher, which is using Ruby, installing some extra packages. Um, then it's going to do a bunch of things. So the point of the Docker Compose ML file is a little bit like when, when you see a make file, you know that you can run make, and hopefully something will happen. When you see a configure script, you can do dot slash configure make make install. When you see a vagrant file, you can do vagrant up. Um, when, you, when you see uh, requirements.txt, you know that you should be able to pip install that thing, et cetera, et cetera. So here, the idea is when you see a Docker Compose ML file, you can do Docker Compose up, and normally, the app should come up, which is exactly what happened here. Um, the output that we see now, yes? Is that a standard procedure? Should we have a Docker Compose ML file? Um, in the Docker ecosystem, it's, um, it's, a, it's a common practice. It's not mandatory. You, we can do differently, of course. But the way things happened is that in the beginning, in the beginning, there was like nothing, just like the first versions of the Docker engine, like four years ago when when we did that presentation at the at PyCon in Santa Clara. Uh, there was just like you could just do Docker run, and then after that, we're like, okay, now we need something to build container images, and that's the Docker file. And then everybody started to write scripts uh, for applications with multiple containers, and at some point. Uh, some tools started to look a little bit better than others. We ended up adopting one tool called Fig, which eventually became Docker Compose. Uh, and most people doing Docker stuff standardized around that. Some people are using other tools because they need some, some, some specific use cases that are not addressed by Docker Compose, but it's extremely rare. I, honestly, I, I haven't seen um, use cases yet that, that you can't uh, address with Docker Compose. Um, it doesn't mean that it's always the best solution. But the, the, the advantage is that when you see that Compose file, you can be like, OK, Docker Compose up, and it should work everywhere. So that what we see now is the output of my um, demo app. On the left here, the almost rainbow thing is uh, the name of the container. And on the right, that's the output for that specific container. So I'm going to freeze that for a second with Control S. And I can see here uh, that's RNG and then Hasher serving HTTP requests. And every four requests, I see the worker saying, 
four units of work done updating hash counter. So if we look exactly at how the worker works, uh, we will see that instead of doing um, random number hash increment, random number hash increment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's actually doing um, random number hash and increment only if it's been at least one second since the last time that we incremented. In other words, it's going to increment the Redis counter only every second. That way, it avoids like flooding uh, Redis with too many requests. Um, so that's why we can see like uh, every four uh, pair of requests this updating hash counter thing. I'm unfreezing this with Control Q. Uh, okay, so that's lots of logs, and they are not extremely exciting. So I'm going to stop that with Control C. When I hit Control C, it's going to ask nicely to the app, "Please shut down." Two containers um, are listening to signals, Hasher and Redis, and they stop immediately. The three others are ignoring signals, so they don't exit. And so after 10 seconds, there is a kind of grace period, and then the engine kills these containers. I'm mentioning that now because this will be useful later. And now I'm going to restart the app, but in the background. Uh, so I will add the dash D flag. Uh, like detached or demonized, is the same flag as for docker run, like docker run dash d to put something in the background, docker compose up dash d to put it in the background as well. Once my app is running in the background, I can do docker compose ps, which shows me the containers of my application. This is very similar to docker ps, but it, it shows a more uh, scoped view. First of all, if I had other unrelated containers, uh, Docker Compose PS will not show them. It will only show me the containers of my app. And instead of showing me like all the details of Docker PS, uh, Docker Compose gives me a more um, a simpler view, which is more relevant uh, for me as a developer. Uh, okay, bring that up, right. So now we want to look at that famous web UI I was mentioning. Uh, if I look in the compose file, I see that I have uh, ports that have been mapped so that I can access containers uh, from the outside. And specifically for the web UI, I see that port 8000 on the VM has been mapped to port 80 in the container. This is also shown here in the output. I see ports 8000 is mapped to 80 which means that from my web browser, I can uh, go to the IP address of my node, as shown on my little uh, piece of paper, on port 8000. And I should see something like this. This is the web UI. The web UI shows me like something going approximately to the speed of four hashes per second, approximately. In fact, it's, there is the four per second, and then there are dips in it if we, if we look more closely. But that's more or less what we should see. Um, little checkpoint, who is seeing the same graph? Who is seeing a different graph or no graph at all? AJ, if you want to. Um, so who had a problem with the? So who, who did not see the graph, I think? You, no, all good? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, all right. Um, yeah, and if you're wondering why it's not a nice and smooth line, it's because I'm not a front-end developer. Front-end is hard. So the goal uh, is to scale up the application. We want that graph to go up and up and up and up instead of being stuck at like four hashes per second. And the contract is we are forbidden from changing a single line of code. We can start multiple containers. We can uh, add some stuff around the containers. But the code of the application itself, we should not change it. Otherwise, it's kind of easy. I can cheat and just increment the counter and job's done. Um, so first, let's check out if maybe we are running out of resources on our Brave uh, VM. I'm going to use some like old school tools, tools like top. 
desktop is going to tell me that the machine is like 99% idle. I see a Python process doing things. That's my probably uh, RNG or maybe the worker, who knows. But like 98% idle. So I have plenty of CPU cycles available. I also have plenty of memory. Those machines have like 4 gigs of RAM and 2 gigs are free. So plenty of memory as well. Um, I could use something like VMstat uh, to see like IO activity. And here, swap like zero, so nothing is uh, swapping in or out. And BIBO is block in, block out, and like nothing's happening either. So TLDR, we have plenty of resources available on these machines. Um, OK, so if we want to scale, we could try the, the simplest thing, which would be to add multiple copies of this worker container. Because this worker container is doing like this infinite loop of uh, getting random number, hashing it, incrementing counter. So if I have multiple copies of that in parallel, I'm going to have multiple uh, containers incrementing the counter at the end of the day. So that, that should end up being faster. Um, Docker Compose has a scale command. So I can do Docker Compose scale, worker equal to, which means I want to have two copies of that specific container. It's extremely straightforward. It's also pretty fast. And when I look at my graph, I see that my graph, instead of being at 4-ish, is now at 8-ish. That seems extremely promising. So let's, uh, let's try to scale higher. Um, so I'm going to go scale to 3. And it did increase further. It looks like we are maybe around 12 or something like that. So that's great news. Um, all right, so let's try directly like to scale to 10. And if it works, then it, that's basically the end of the workshop. We won. Um, but of course, as you could expect, uh, things are not as easy as that. And it doesn't work. It, it stays kind of stuck at 10 hashes per second. And I can add as many workers as I want. It's not going to improve. Um, we are stuck at 10 hashes per second. Yes. Uh, can you repeat the question? Oh, what is the worker? Yeah. So the, the worker um, is the, the container that is running this infinite loop of, of code. The, um, the worker is, so yeah, it, worker is a container. And if we look at what exactly it's doing, it's the main loop I was describing a little bit earlier. Like I'm, I'm going to show the, the code quickly just because it's so short. It's like 70 lines of code. Um, the worker is doing it, let the work loop uh, infinitely. And if I look at work loop, it's, um, so it's a while true. And in the while true, I basically do work once. And that code around here, it's to increment the counter. So I'm doing work once uh, infinitely. And if I look at work once, it's, it's going like get random bytes, then it's hashing these bytes, and that's it. And so if I look at get random bytes, it's doing um, a request to the web service RNG. And hash bytes is doing a request to the web service hasher. So that's the, the, the core of the Docker Coins demo app. It's that thing doing this infinite loop, like generating random data, hashing the data, and incrementing the counter. Yes. All these containers are currently running on node one, yes. And they are all using the, the, the talking to the same Redis uh, data store, yes. But they are separate containers, yes. If I do, for instance, at this point, uh, Docker Compose PS, it will show me that I have now a bunch of containers. I still have one copy of Hasher, Redis, RNG, WebUI, but I have 20 copies of Walker. And if I do Docker PS, um, I'm unzooming. It's OK if you can't really read the details. But we can see here that's a bunch of workers. And then that's RNG. 
Web UI, Hasher, Redis, and that's the first worker. And everything is currently only on Node 1. For now, we're like running things locally. Uh, maybe it's a single server, or that could also be our local development machine. Uh, but for now, yeah, it's only on Node 1. Yes? When I, okay, when I was running top, what I'm seeing here um, is the process list for m Node 1. And um, if we... So yes, absolutely. If I, if I run top again to see, okay, maybe now I'm like maxing out my CPU, I see, well, nope, I, I have 96% of idle CPU cycles. I'm, I'm using more CPU, so I, I really did something, but I'm still not maxing out my CPU. And here in the output of top, I see a bunch of uh, Python processes that are the Python processes running in the containers. Um, that might be helpful for me to show the, the output of the, uh, of the process forest, the, the process tree. Um, so we can recognize like the usual suspects of like kernel threads and yada yada. And then uh, when we get to the containers, uh, w when, you, when you look at the Docker machine, you will see the processes inside the containers on the machine. So the containers are transparent in a way for your system tools. So all the workers, all those Python processes, they show up here. I can see like Python worker.py here, and then here, and then here, and here, and here, et cetera, et cetera. So you, 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 there are a bunch of uh, system tools that you can use to find out what's going on with your containers because they will just work normally uh, on, on the machine. And the containers will show up uh, as regular processes. Or rather, to be more accurate, the processes inside the containers will show up as normal processes on the host, which is very convenient. Yes? Right, good question. So the question is, when you scale the worker, it's like all nice and everything, but if I scale another service like Redis or um, Hasher, what happens? Is there a load balancer? And the answer is that if I do that, I'm creating extra copies of that container, but Compose doesn't have load balancing. So I have multiple copies, but only the first one will be receiving traffic. So if I create multiple copies of Hasher, for instance, that's great. Now I have multiple copies of Hasher, but only the first one will be receiving requests. The, the other copies will just be sitting here doing nothing. So that's why I can scale the worker, because the worker is connecting to other things. Uh, but if I scale the other things with Compose, it won't do anything. Which is why we will use SwarmKit, because SwarmKit has load balancing, but I'm spoiling. <laughs> okay. All right, so we, we are stuck at 10 hashes per second, and something else seems to be slowing us down. Uh, we still have resources, like when I show with top, we still have resources, we still have memory. Um, there is still very little I.O. activity on the machine. So to try to get an idea of what's going on, we are going to use um, old-style uh, HTTP performance analysis. Uh, for instance, we, we could directly use curl. Like I'm going to do like, uh, well, first, um, if I look in the compose file, uh, I'm going to see that not only the web UI, but the other services are exposed. Like RNG is exposed on port 8001. Hasher is exposed on port 8002. And if I do curl localhost 8001, it tells me RNG is running. That was a little bit slow, by the way. That's sketchy. If I do the same thing on port 8002, I get a response almost instantly. That seems better. Let's do a few requests. Yeah, 8002 seems fast. 8001 looks slow. Let's get a little bit more data using HTTPing. HTTPing, uh, it's exactly like ping, except that instead of throwing ICMP packets at the target, it's going to make uh, HTTP requests. So you can do HTTPing localhost 8001. 
and it's going to time how long it takes to just do a simple get to that service. And it takes a really long time, like 1.8 seconds. Uh, for a service running locally, that's really slow, um, especially for a ping request. Just as a comparison, I'm going to do the same thing on 8002. And on 8002, I get like less than one millisecond, which is much more reasonable for a local service. So with, without even looking farther, it looks like the service running on port 8001 has some problems. That's the RNG service. So that's the point where um, our um, f favorite or least favorite uh, Unix belt and suspender all style uh, sysadmin guru drops in and say, I know what's going on, that's because of entropy. Um, because when you generate random numbers on a Linux machine, uh, you, you're depleting the entropy pool. The entropy pool is a bunch of random bits, but like random in the mathematical sense. Um, and the kernel uh, fills that pool by using uh, data sources that are really random. Uh, like, for instance, the tenth uh, decimal of the temperature of the CPU uh, or um, the interval in microseconds between two mouse clicks or between two key presses or between two packets showing up on the network interface, uh, th that kind of, of thing. Um, but those, those events um, are show up in uh, at a pretty slow speed. So there is this entropy pool. It's like putting random numbers in the pool. And when you generate numbers, you get numbers from that pool. And when that pool is empty, uh, it blocks. Like you say, I want to generate random number. And instead of getting it immediately, you have to wait until some random stuff happens on the machine, refilling that entropy pool. This would almost be a good explanation. Uh, we are going to accept it for now because it will give us an opportunity to scale out, and that's the whole point of the tutorial. But this is completely false. The problem is not entropy. Uh, so before moving forward, we are going to uh, shut down and clean up nicely the, the app that we had started on Node 1 with Docker Compose down. So again, I can see that Hasher and Redis immediately exit because they react nicely to the uh, term signal. And everybody else is like, oh, a term signal. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> and after 10 seconds, then the engine sends a kill signal, which forcibly uh, shut d shuts down the, the containers. If I check with Docker PS, OK, the, the machine is completely clean again. Perfect. So our solution to fix the entropy problem is to scale out the RNG service on multiple machines. We'll put one copy of the RNG service on each machine so that we can tap from multiple entropy pools. Scaling out. So questions before I... No, OK, onwards. So to scale out, we are going to use SwarmKit. Uh, SwarmKit is an open source toolkit to build multi-node systems. Um, you can use it to build distributed systems with containers, but you can also use it to run pretty much anything. It, it has a, a bunch of primitives um, that are used by Docker to start like containers uh, on a cluster, but that you could use for other workloads as well. It's a reusable library, so you can use it independently of Docker if you want, just like a bunch of other components in Docker. And it's a plumbing part, um, so there are many other libraries in, in the same uh, situation. Uh, so it, it lives in its own little uh, repository on the side. Uh, and when you combine all those things together, that's how you get like Docker. Um, so what do we have in SwarmKit? Uh, first, uh, one thing that we notice is that when you want a distributed system, uh, you need to have some kind of highly available data store. You need to be able to store the, uh, the crown jewels somewhere. Uh, and that place has to be really highly available. When I say really highly available, I, th I don't mean like, uh, oh yeah, we have a um, uh, SQL database and we have a replica and every maybe six or 18 months, uh, the primary crashes and then, then somebody gets paged at three in the morning and we switch over the replica and then we're good for the next six months. No, I'm, I'm seeing highly available, like that thing needs to be able to crash and restart 
part and another one goes down, etc. And everything must continue to work without human intervention and without anybody noticing anything whatsoever. So really highly available, that's what we mean. Um, so very often, um, distributed systems are going to use uh, Zookeeper or uh, etcd or the algorithms uh, and protocols behind these. Here, um, the, 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 the thing that SwarmKit is using is the Raft protocol or the Raft algorithm. I, I think the only proper way to talk about it is the things described in the Raft paper, maybe. Um, so, <coughs> the, so, so this thing is embedded uh, within SwarmKit uh, to avoid depending on, on a, on a third-party external service. Uh, this is because when when we started to build SwarmKit and build this with the systems with Docker, we realized that when you look at the the how to or the okay how do I build my cluster, the first step is not even like install Docker or install containers or whatever is install Zookeeper or install etcd or install something else. It's like mm, that's wrong because when you look at how do I operate Zookeeper, it's like well you lose five years of your life and part of your soul and sanity and like. <laughs> Nobody really wants that. Uh, each CD gets it much, much, much better, uh, especially when you come from Zookeeper, you're like, oh, thanks, God. Um, but still, it's like the first step is install each CD. You're like, hmm, that still feels wrong. We sh the, the first step should just be make it work. So th that's why we decided that Raft should be embedded in, in SwarmKit instead of um, being abstracted behind something like each CD. Another very important thing was to have dynamic reconfiguration. Dynamic reconfiguration means that when, when you scratch the layer a little bit and you look at all those um, highly available data stores, there is very often uh, the notion of server versus agent, or there is, a, there is again the kind of primary secondary thing, except that instead of having one primary and a bunch uh, of secondaries, you have multiple primaries, uh, but you have like the notion of nodes with different levels. And um, if, if we look again at, at Zookeeper, uh, and I, I don't want to point fingers here, it's mostly because Zookeeper was the, the first uh, system to implement that in a relatively easy way. But when you want to reconfigure that, when you say, I want to go from five nodes to seven nodes, it's, it's painful. Um, I'm not putting the blame or anything. Again, it's like when Zookeeper was designed, uh, it was great to think that we're going to have five nodes and you can crash a node, it can come back, and everything will be fine. That was already like a huge milestone. But if you want to extend those five nodes to seven, then it's a different story. So here it was like, okay, we want to learn from that and we want to be able to reconfigure things um, painlessly. Then um, services are managed with a declarative API. Uh, by opposition to an imperative API. An imperative API is, I want to start a container. I want to start another container. What containers are running right now? Those two containers, okay, that's great. Um, a, a declarative API is, I want to run those two containers uh, de defined here, and I want them to be up and running at all times. And then, if something happens to these containers, the system uh, should fix it, basically. With an imperative API, I start a container, and if something happens to this machine, this container, um, I have to come back and see what's running and restart the containers. With a declarative API, I say, this is what I want, and the system makes it happen, basically. Uh, SwarmKit integrates with uh, network constructs like overlay networks and load balancing. We will see more on that later. And it has an extremely strong emphasis on security. Uh, I will describe a little bit more the security fears later. Uh, but yeah, it's the security is strong in this one. So what are the concepts in SwarmKit? Uh, we have the notion of a cluster, so that's a bunch of nodes. Uh, you can have a one-node cluster, that's totally fine. So if you want, you can have your Swarm cluster on your local development machine. But of course, things get more exciting when you have multiple nodes. A node can be either a manager or a worker. The manager or managers um, are the nodes that are part of the Raft consensus. So they are the nodes that store the very important data uh, of the cluster. You communicate with those managers using the SwarmKit API, which is the API that lets you control the cluster. 
one of the managers is automatically elected uh, as the leader, and it's the one that will do the, the important things that require coordination. So for instance, if you just want the, the list of what do we have in the cluster, you don't have to go to the leader. However, when you want to create a service, update a service definition, that has to go to the leader. But this is done transparently, so when, when you talk to the leader node, it's going to carry your, your orders, but when you talk to a follower, like one of the managers that is not the leader, it's going to transparently forward your request uh, to the leader and then forward you the response. So you don't have to worry about who's the leader, um, you just talk to one of the managers. And then you have the, yes? Right, so what happens if I lose the leader? So when you lose the leader, uh, the, 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 the health check will automatically say, okay, so we lost the leader, uh, so now we need to elect a new leader. Uh, so a new leader is automatically elected. Um, and then I, th I think you, at, at worst, what happens is that if you are submitting a request and while you submit the request, something goes wrong, then you will get an error message telling you, okay, something really weird happened while you asked me to do that. Please try again. And when you try again, this time, your request will be routed to the new leader and things will go fine. But if you got a response telling you, I got your request, let's say, oh, I want to start an Nginx uh, service. If it tells you, I got it, it means it got it. It means your request has been stored in the raft log. So even if the leader goes down at that time, you're good because the, the new appointed leader uh, will kind of uh, pick up the, the job where the previous leader left it. So the, the worst that can happen is you get an error and you just retry and, and that time it goes fine. So those are the managers and then the workers. The workers get their instructions from the managers um, and that's pretty much it. Both workers and managers can run containers. Very often if you have big clusters, uh, kind of uh, uh, good advice is only run workloads on the managers, on the, sorry, <laughs> on the workers, uh, so that the managers are available for cluster management, but you can absolutely uh, run workloads on both types of nodes. Uh, this is a kind of illustration, so all, all the blue whales are the nodes on the cluster. Uh, the blue um, whales that have a monkey on them are the managers, and the pink monkey is the leader, and the gray monkeys are the followers, and the dotted triangle is the raft data store that is distributed uh, between the managers. Also, I can draw. More swarm keep concepts. So wh what can we do with that API that is exposed by the managers? Well, that's the API where we will talk about services and what we want to run. So what, what happens is that instead of saying Docker run this, I will say I want five copies of Nginx to be running, or I want seven copies of Worker to be running uh, with that much RAM and this and that, and then I give this request to uh, the manager, and the manager will store that request in, in the raft log, and then it's going to make it happen, basically. And it's going to continuously monitor that, watch it, so that if at some point the reality is different from what I asked, it, it's going to take action. So let's say I asked uh, five workers, um, so it makes it happen, and then once I have my five workers, let's say one of the nodes goes away, so I'm down to four, we will be like, oh, then there is a difference between what we have and what we want, so let's start an extra worker. I'm back to five, great. Problem, it was, it was just a network split, so the node that I thought was gone comes back, and now I have six workers. Uh, it's going to see that again, it's going to take down one of the workers. Maybe not the last one, by the way. So when you when you look, you instead of seeing one, two, three, four, five, you might see one, two, four, five, six, for instance. But the result is you have five workers. Um, so the the leader has a number of subsystems to break down your request. Like uh, I want to run five workers. Um, th there was going to be. Uh, a scheduler to decide uh, where the, um, the things should be running depending on the resource that you asked for. Um, it's going to assign IP addresses, it's going to uh, push that to the nodes, uh, make sure that the nodes are there, like monitor them, etc., etc. So all those, all, all of these features, like uh, swarm kits and like the managers, workers, raft. Uh, those things 
are uh, available since Docker 1.12, so it's been like one year and something ago. Um, but all these features are by default kind of sleeping, uh, and they are enabled only when you enable swarm mode. Um, this is because um, m many people often like want to say, oh, Docker is annoying because it changes all the time and so fast that we can't follow, etc. And uh, it, it's, it's partly true, but we also do things extremely conservatively in the sense that, for instance, this is a huge lot of changes that you can imagine. So to make sure that things would not change overnight for people, we said, okay, we ship the next version, but all those features will be uh, behind a feature switch, basically. You have to enable swarm mode so that all these things become available. And as long as you don't enable swarm mode, all this code is not running untouched. Like, I don't know how to, to call that. It's not dead code, but almost. And then you have a bunch of new commands uh, that are available only in swarm mode, like docker swarm to manage, like to create a swarm or to join a swarm, docker node to see what nodes I have in, in my cluster, and docker service to manage services, create and destroy them, update them, and a bunch of other commands as well. All right. For instance, if I try one of these commands uh, on my node, like I try <coughs> Uh, docker node ls, it's telling me, well, this node is not a swarm manager. So you, it's, it's, you, you can't access um, swarm mode commands. You have to use docker swarm init or docker swarm join uh, to enable swarm mode and then try again. Uh, so there are only two ways to enable swarm mode. One is to transform your machine into a one node cluster, and the other one is to join an existing cluster. So we are going to do exactly that. We are going to do docker swarm init to transform node 1 into a one node cluster. OK, so now the node uh, is the manager of a one node cluster. Uh, this command also tells me if you want to add more nodes to the swarm, you should run that command on the nodes. Uh, but let's not pay attention to that for now. If I try docker node ls again, uh, it's telling me, I'm going to unzoom a little bit. It's telling me, so that, that's my node, uh, node one. It's ready, available, and it's the current leader. So now all the, all the swarm mode commands are available to me. Okay. So now we want to add more nodes, because a one node cluster is not very interesting. Uh, so when we did docker swarm in it, it, sh it showed us the command that we need to copy paste to the other nodes. Problem is, I, I cleared the screen. <laughs> so how do I see the, that command again? I just do docker swarm join token. And it's telling me, hey, do you want the worker or the manager token? I'm going to ask for the worker token. And I'm going to explain in a few minutes what exactly is that token. It's kind of the password to join the swarm, but not exactly. So more on that in a few minutes. So I just have to run that command on another node to join the swarm with the other nodes. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to log into node 2, SSH node 2, and then I just copy paste that command. And it says, this node joined a swarm as a worker. That's it. So I want to check if this really worked. So I'm going to do docker node ls to see my, li my list of nodes. And I would expect to see now like two nodes. Well, except when I do that, it's telling me this node is not a swarm manager. And it adds the explanation, worker nodes can't be used to view or change the cluster state. You should run this command on a manager node or make this, the current node a manager. So again, the, this is one of the security design principles in SwarmKit called list privilege, which means that uh, when you don't need to know something or to have access to something, then you don't. In that case, node 2 is just a, a worker node. So it doesn't have access to all the, the important data that is in the raft log. It, it, the only thing it knows is that I'm a member of a swarm. I know a few things about that swarm. I know the addresses of the managers because I, I need to connect to them and get commands from them. 
but that's it. It doesn't know about other nodes. It, it doesn't know other things for now. All right, let's go back to node one. And now that I'm on node one, I'm going to do Docker node ls. And now I get um, my list of nodes. Yes. Is it possible to have, right, is it possible to have multiple nodes on node one? Like, for instance, if I want to simulate a cluster but on a single machine? Um, yes and no. So if, if you want to do that, for instance, on a local development machine, the easiest thing uh, is to use something like VirtualBox, for instance, and start multiple VMs. That way you have like really m multiple nodes on your local machine. Uh, and you can do that really easily by using Docker Machine. Docker Machine is a, an external tool um, that lets you manage Docker machines. <laughs> and so you can do something like Docker Machine create um, dash dash driver virtual box and that will create um, a new VM running Docker uh, using the locally installed virtual box. And you can just run that a few times and you get uh, really nicely independent nodes. Now, if you're in a really specific scenario, like let's say you are um, developing Swarm or SwarmKit itself, and you want to run multiple nodes on the same machine but without a VM, you can also do that. Um, you will need to run multiple Docker engines side by side. Uh, and just make sure that they use different directories to store all their important data. It's, it's not really recommended, but you can absolutely do that. And there is even other methods, like if you, if you are working on SwarmKit itself, so you're working on like the replication protocol and leader election, et cetera, et cetera, and you're not here to run containers, you're just here to manage a distributed system, then uh, SwarmKit itself, like the, the, the library, uh, can also be um, compiled into a standalone binary and run independently of the Docker engine. And in that case, you can also have multiple copies on the same machine. So it's like, yes, you can, but really, when you, when you want to do that, normally you, you just start multiple VMs. And if it's locally, it's fine. You just start multiple VMs locally, and, and that works great. OK, so we have a two nodes cluster, one manager, one leader. Uh, what do we want to do next? Oh, yeah, it's now time for me to explain exactly what uh, is hidden in, in this token. So first, what happens when we did Docker Swarm in it? Uh, so first, uh, our swarm has a CA, a certificate authority. Uh, so out of curiosity, who, who knows about like certificates and TLS and that kind of stuff? And who doesn't? A few people as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a really super short version, um, but this is about public key cryptography. Public Key cryptography is a kind of crypto where instead of having one key, and the key is the same to crypt and decrypt, you have two keys that uh, complement each other in such a way that um, if you have one of the keys, you can't compute the other one. I mean, you can if you let computers run for a few billion years maybe, but uh, at the human scale, you can't. And if you crypt something with one of the keys, it has to be decrypted with the other key and vice versa. This is how we get like a, a, a web of trust. Uh, this is how the um, TLS and like the, the little padlock that tells us, yes, you're actually talking to your bank thing works because um, the web server of your bank or Facebook or whatever uh, has its own key and it has, uh, it has a, a, a public key uh, which uh, it can give you and you say, this is my public key. So basically, when you want to talk to me, you can use that public key. And that key itself is kind of is signed by an authority above that. And so you can you have that certificate and you can, with the information at your disposal, you can be like, yep, this is uh, th that third party, maybe very sign or let's encrypt or uh, s some third party that I know is confirming me that, yep, this is really the the, the key um, for your bank or for Facebook or for, or for whomever you think you're talking to. So with the swarm, it's going to be the same idea. We're going to have a kind of uh, an entity above 
So that's the, the, the CA, the Certificate Authority. And that CA is going to sign everybody's keys to say, yep, I, I know that person, I know that, now they're legit. Um, th this is a pretty common way to do um, like verification of identity in, in, in systems like that because uh, you don't need to interact with the third party. You just need to have uh, the public key of, of the third party, so you just need it once, and once you have it, you can verify other people's identities. So it's extremely convenient, because you don't need, each time you, you get somebody's credentials, you don't need to go to the central thing to ask, is this legit or not? You can do the verification yourself. So. Um, in, inside the cluster, Swarm is using that so that when the nodes talk to each other, uh, they can verify each other's identity without having to confirm with the central authority. So the, the central authority, the, the, the certificate authority, um, lives on the manager nodes. So when you do Docker Swarm in it, that CA is created, like its, its own set of keys, public private keys is created, uh, and then a first uh, key pair is created for the first node. Uh, that key pair is uh, signed by the authority, uh, and, and then the joint tokens are created. So when you do Docker Swarm in it, there is this whole uh, public key crypto system that is set up automatically for you. Now, what exactly do we have in the joint token? The joint token, if we look at it like here, if I do Docker, Swarm, joint token, worker, and I do the same thing with manager. If I look at my tokens, at first they look the same, like swarm token version one, and then like there is some random things here, same, 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 and it stops here. And then there is a different part here, like the, the, the second half is different. So the first half here, that's the fingerprint of my swarm. Um, it's a way for me to, when, when I connect to a swarm, uh, to know that I'm connecting to the right thing. So it's, it's not a password for me. It's a kind of reverse password for the swarm. Um, a, a fingerprint here, it's, it's a hash of the public key of, of, the, of the CA of that swarm. Uh, if you're not familiar with public key crypto, uh, this is a kind of, we, we could kind of simplify to yeah, maybe a fingerprint, or th this is the shadow that you should see when you look at the cluster un under a certain angle. It's difficult uh, to make your cluster have that fingerprint if it's not the real one. So this is a way for the new nodes who join the swarm to make sure that they are joining the actual swarm and not some third party uh, Russian impersonator. The last part of the token here, that's the secret part. That's the equivalent of a password, and that is the thing that will be used by the swarm to make sure that the node has the right to join that swarm. And it will be different for worker nodes and for manager nodes. All right. Um, if tokens get compromised, no problem, you can rotate them super easily. And when you rotate a token, you're not kicking out existing nodes, you're just preventing nodes from joining with the old tokens. So now when you do Docker Swarm join, what exactly happens? So first, the, the node um, connects to the, to the swarm using the, the seed address that you give it. Uh, it's doing a little token dance to check, like, am I talking to the right swarm? Yep, it, it validates. And then the swarm is like, is this node legit? Yep, OK. Then the node, the new node, will create its key pair, and it will um, do uh, what we call a CSR, a certificate signing request. Uh, if you have ever set up uh, SSL or TLS on web servers, you might be familiar with that. Uh, the if, if there is only one nice thing to know about that is that it's a process that lets you um, si sign, get, if I get your key signed by a third party, but without giving out the key. Because basically, you get the public part of the key signed, but you keep the private part of the key. So that means that uh, even if one node gets compromised at some point, um, that, that doesn't compromise the keys of the nodes that have been talking to that one node. 
all right, once the node has its sets of key and credentials, uh, then if it is a manager, it joins the raft uh, consensus. So it will connect to the leader, it will say, hey, I'm, I'm now part of, of raft, so they do the raft protocol to add a new node, it will get a copy of the raft data, and then it will accept connection from worker nodes. If the node is a worker, then it will connect to one of the existing managers, and that's it. Now, um, cluster communication. So the control plane, so the communication between the, the different nodes, is encrypted using AES in Galois counter mode. The keys are automatically uh, rotated twice a day. And the authentication, so how do a node check that it's actually talking to another node, is using mutual TLS, as I described before. And those certificates are rotated every three months. Um, the, the certificate rotation, again, if you deployed TLS or SSL for websites, you might remember that thing like every year you have to renew certificates. Well, that, that's, th that's a, that one thing, except it's done automatically and every three months uh, for the nodes. That means, for instance, that if a node uh, is disconnected from the swarm for more than three months, then when it comes back, um, his credentials are not good anymore, so it will be kicked out. And it will have basically to rejoin the swarm. Um, you can customize a bunch of these things, so you can change those delays. You can, if you already have a, a, a pub key in uh, infrastructure, you can use an external CA to sign uh, the, the nodes uh, certificates, etc., etc. And the data plane, so the communication between containers, is not crypted by default, but it can be. Uh, and it's just like when you create the networks, uh, you have an option when you say, I want this network to be encrypted. And when you do that, it's going to use IPsec and use the kernel IPsec implementation, which means that if you have CPUs that can do hardware crypto, it's going to leverage hardware crypto. Yes? Is there a performance hit for enabling crypto? Uh, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, if you if if your workload is mostly like let's say traditional web apps, um, I would say the performance hit is going to be really hard to notice, especially on on modern CPUs where um, crypto is decently accelerated. Um, you, you won't see much of a difference because your most of the CPU that you're burning is probably not in networked transit between the different containers. M most likely, when you burn CPU, it's because I don't know, like you're resizing images or uh, you have database requests, etc., etc. Now there are some scenarios where things could be very different. For instance, let's say that you are. Uh, receiving really high resolution video um, and then you are like slicing that in multiple substreams and then they are transcoded and then you are like having kind of real-time pipeline of uh, high transit things um, and, and you're pushing like multiple gigabits of, uh, of data over the network then the encryption uh, could be noticeable uh, especially if you haven't tuned on the kernel level the things to leverage uh, hardware crypto. Um, it's uh, and uh, th th that's also one of the reasons why the crypto here is not enabled by default. Well, the, the main reason is mostly for observability uh, because we found out that there are more people who want to see what's going on with tools like TCP dump and Ethereal than people who absolutely want to encrypt that communication because if you are running on your own hardware uh, and your own network and everything, encrypting, encrypting a communication between two servers on the same rack is probably a sign that something's wrong. <laughs> I mean, you, you can do it, but generally it means you don't even trust your own network, so that's bad news. Um, same thing on the, on the cloud. Like Some people want to encrypt between VMs on, on the cloud, but again, if you do that, you, you have probably other things you should worry about. Um, so that's why it's not enabled by default. But um, the, um, it can be done with minimal uh, performance impact. But yeah, as always, it depends. <laughs> um, if you want to know more about the low-level details, like exactly how SwarmKit works, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, I have in the slides like a bunch uh, of links to slides and videos uh, that will let you know everything you want to know, and even a little bit more about SwarmKit. 
Okay, back to our cluster, we have one manager node, one worker node. Um, so if we lose the manager node, um, we are dead. So we want to fix that. We want to improve the, high availabil the availability sorry, of the cluster. So what we could do would be we could SSH to node 3, node 4, node 5, and we could like copy-paste the command to add a manager node. Uh, but we could also strip things because we are civilized people. And uh, by shell, I mean not that shell, but that shell. So the first thing we're going to do is to get the manager token, so the token that we will use to join a swarm. Um, so docker swarm join token manager. And since I want just the token, not the whole yada yada around it telling me what to do, I'm using dash q, like quiet, to say just the token. I'm putting that in an environment variable. And then I am doing a little, sorry? Oh, it's, it's exactly the same command as on the slide. All the commands that you see me typing are mostly the, the commands that are on the slide. <laughs> um, normally, if, if you can't see the slides, if you go to, oh, they don't match, damn. Uh, did, did you take like the middle link or the top link? Because the, the top link is the self-paced version that it's like the extended edition with like 370 something slides. But if you click on the middle link that says PyCon, you should have uh, 212 slides. So the for loop is going to be for node in node 3, node 4, node 5. Do um, SSH dollar node, docker swarm join, dash dash token dollar token. And then I have to give a seed node, so one of the nodes to connect to, so node 1, because it's a member of the swarm, and a port 2377. So Port numbers, 2375 is the Docker API uh, without encryption, 2376 is the Docker API with encryption, and 2377 is the intra-cluster communication protocol. And then when I do done, it's going to iterate over the three nodes, asking me for each of them to confirm their public key. This is fine, this is fine too, this is fine too. And that's it. Now, if I do docker node ls, I have five nodes. Four of them are managers. Node one is the leader. Node two is like just a worker. And node three, four, five are um, managers, but not leaders. OK. Oh, and when I do docker node ls, for instance, there is a little asterisk here, a little star that tells me which node I'm currently talking to. So for instance, if I do ssh node 3 and I do docker node ls, uh, I have exactly the same output as before, except the little star is now next to node 3. It's just a little convenience so that I, I can know which node did serve my request. OK. Um, so now, just to make things more kind of uh, fair and square, I want all my nodes to be managers. But node 2 is not a manager yet. So there is like the one option would be, well, I'm just going to kick node, node 2 out of the cluster and rejoin, or I can promote it. That's way easier. So that's the, the when I say like dynamic reconfiguration, that's what I was talking about. And Promoting a node, so transforming a worker node into a manager node, is as easy as docker node promote node 2. And that's it. Now if I do docker node ls, everybody is a manager, nobody is working anymore, that's great. <coughs> Remember, the manager can also run containers, so th this is still a useful cluster. How many managers do we need? And I'm talking about th that kind of managers, not the other kind of managers. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so the, um, we need quorum. Quorum, the, the idea behind quorum, so the, the literal definition of quorum is the, the number of people you need in like a voting assembly to be able to make decisions. Because if like, uh, if, if you have, I don't know, let's say a homeowner association and you have 20, 20 homeowners but only one person shows up for the meetings, uh, then there is no quorum. That person can't take decisions, I mean, normally. Uh, so here the quorum is how many nodes need to be there in order for the cluster to be able to function correctly. And the quorum here is you need a strict majority, which translates in mathematical terms to if you have two n plus one nodes, you can tolerate n failures. In other words, if you have one manager, well, you can have no failure at all, because if you lose your only manager, then you're down to zero manager and nothing works. If you have three managers, then you can have one failure. So to understand why, the idea is that, okay, I have my three manager nodes, and then something happens. For instance, like, one of the managers goes down. Now I'm down to two managers, and they know that they are still here, and they know that they, ha they have strict majority, two over three, so they can continue to work. Now imagine another node went down, so I'm down to one manager node. That node could think, oh, I'm, I'm basically the Highlander. I'm the last uh, remaining manager node. It's my responsibility to continue operations. Nope, because in fact, there was a network split. So this node is here alone, and there are two other nodes here, but that node has no idea. That node cannot know if it's isolated uh, or if it's the last one standing. So by default, it has to wait because it doesn't have quorum. So that's why you need the, the strict majority. Um, so three managers, you can tolerate one failure. Five managers, you can tolerate two failures, which seems safe. It's like belts and suspender kind of thing. Um, but if you look at it differently, it means that if you are doing a maintenance on one of your managers, uh, during the maintenance, you can tolerate one failure, which suddenly is it's still safe, but not as safe as we thought it would be. So five managers is a, is a good number. If you have seven managers or more, maybe you're a little bit paranoid, or maybe you've been carrying a pager for way too long. <coughs> a very common question is, why can't I just make my life easier and make all my node managers so that I don't have this stupid distinction between managers and non-managers? Flat hierarchies, yay. Um, so there is a problem if you do that. First, intuitively, it's harder to reach consensus in big groups. Like if you have 100 humans trying to decide whether they should go for sushi or tacos, it's harder than if it's just like five people trying to decide. Um, and if we translate that to protocols, um, th there is a technical reason why there is the same problem. With the Raft algorithm, the Raft protocol, when you do a write, you have to send that write to everyone. And then you have to wait until at least half of the nodes told you, yep, I got it. So if you have five managers and you want to write, you need to send your writes to five nodes. Okay. If you have 1,000 managers and you want to make a write, you have to send your write to 1,000 nodes, which is a lot of traffic going over the network, which is going to slow your network down a lot. Yeah. Right. Can I? Wh why can't like? Why did I not put like two managers? Uh, if you have two managers. Um, that's going to seem weird, but you actually are less reliable than if you had one manager. Why? Because if you have two managers, if you lose one of them, the other one can't function anymore because it's like, well, I need strict majority. So with two nodes, I need the two nodes to be there. So it's less reliable because if I have only one manager, okay, the probability of, for failure is probability of failure for that node. If I have two managers, now if any of them fails, which is more likely to happen, uh, I'm going to lose quorum anyway. Will the command prevent me from having an even number of managers? No, it will let me do so, if only because between one and three there is two, so to speak. So if I want to go from one manager to three managers, I have to briefly have two managers in between. So it, it will let me do whatever I want, but I probably should not have two managers. Um, so yeah, if, I, if all my nodes become managers, 
I'm going to have serious network problems because each time I have a write, uh, it has to go to all those manager nodes and my network is going to hurt a lot. So how, what's, like, how many managers should I really do depending on my use case and everything? Um, so my kind of rule of thumb um, is first I break down my cluster in groups and each group should be well connected to, to the rest of its group. So I, for instance, if I have nodes on West Coast and East Coast, that would be two groups because they are too far from each other. If, if in West Coast I have uh, something in Seattle and something in the Bay Area, maybe that would be two groups as well because it's probably going to be farther than 10 milliseconds apart. I say 10 milliseconds, but that's completely arbitrary. I could have put eight or 16 or it's basically stuff that is well connected, keep together. And if it's not well connected, then put them apart. Once you have your groups, you take each group one by one. And if you have less than 10 nodes, you can say, okay, let's keep things simple and make all of them managers, that's fine. Now, if you have bigger groups, let, let's say between 10 and 100 nodes, pick five nodes, if possible, pick stable nodes and make them managers. When I say stable, um, that means, for instance, if you're doing cloud deployment, cloud deployment and you do some auto scaling and, or, or anything elastic where you add and remove nodes, um, usually you have a baseline uh, of nodes that you keep always on. Those should be the managers because uh, the, the, the system will let you like, remove and re-add and restart managers, et cetera, et cetera. But if you can avoid it, that's just better. So uh, typically, for instance, if you're using EC2, um, make sure that your uh, managers will be in the your reserved instance pool and that the workers will be in your on-demand or spot, spot instance pool. If you have more than 100 nodes, uh, in a group. Now it's a good time to start watch these metrics if you haven't been doing so before. Watch the CPU and RAM. I, I will explain more like when to watch what. If you have more than 1,000 nodes, uh, now is a good time to see like what's the biggest machine that money can get me because at, at that point um, you will start to run into um, performance bottlenecks. And if, your specific, if, if with your specific workload, you see, okay, I'm using too much CPU or too much RAM on my managers, then you might decide to break down the uh, groups. Now, um, what exactly is the upper limit? Internally, we did some testing up to, I think, almost 10,000 nodes, and everything was fine. And that was in a single cloud region, so the machines are well connected and everything. Uh, the biggest takeaway was that at some point, you need a bigger manager. Um, and the community did some testing, so they, dis they decided to disregard entirely my advice about like keeping things together. They say, let's build Swarmzilla. And they had one manager and everybody contributed a few instances, like, oh, I have some digital ocean droplets, oh, I have some extra like EC2 machines, or uh, I have like a, a few racks that we've deployed, but we were not gonna use them before next month, so, um, have fun. And they ended up having almost 5,000 nodes uh, all over the place. So latency was terrible. Uh, and it works. The, the, the main conclusion was that uh, as you add more nodes, you need more CPU on the manager because just because of the sheer amount of updates for Keep Alive, etc. And as you add more containers, uh, you need more RAM because the RAM required to manage the nodes themselves is fairly low. But when you have millions of containers, then you need a bunch of RAM just to keep track of them. And the, the main bottleneck that they had was when scheduling large jobs. So doing the equivalent of Docker Compose scale worker equals 70,000, that was really slow. So that's one of the things that, I mean, we want to improve it, but at the same time, um, not everybody needs to scale to 70,000 containers, and when they do, we can help. <laughs> All right, so it will be, let's see. Um, I think it's a good break point for the, for the coffee. Um, if you had problems setting up your Swarm cluster, uh, feel free to ask me during the break. I'm going to try and find coffee, but otherwise I'll be, I'll be around. And let's reconvene at 10.50.
Okay. Um, so, uh, summary of previous episodes. We have a five nodes cluster. Uh, all the nodes are managers. Uh, I looked quickly on the um, on Gitter to see if people had questions. I think we addressed most of the questions on the fly. Uh, so the temperature check, who thinks that we are going too slow? Nobody? Too fast? Maybe one, a few, a few people? Just the right speed? All right, so I'm going to slow down a tiny little bit. Um, and yeah, I think we should be fine. Yeah, so summary of previous episodes, we have a five nodes swarm cluster. Now, how do we run stuff on that cluster? So if you've done some stuff with Docker, you might know that to create containers, the command is docker run. So what we just have to do is mentally replace docker run with docker service create. So for instance, if I want to uh, do like a docker run and I want to ping Google, so I want to use, let's say, an Ubuntu image and I want to do ping good.jl. Um, downloads the Ubuntu image, and whoops, oh yeah, the Ubuntu image doesn't have ping anymore. So let's use the Alpine image instead. Voila. So that's, that's not how I run a single container on Docker, like the, the normal way, the classic Docker way. So if I want to do the same thing on Swarm, I replace Docker run with Docker service create. And when I do that, um, instead of getting the output, now I get this, which is the ID of the service that I just created. And I get a, an extra kind of warning thing about like dash dash detach equal false. And I will tell more about this uh, in a few minutes. Um, so the big difference is that instead of showing me the output of my container, it's putting the container in the background um, and giving me the, the ID of, of the service. Uh, so what I did is I, I filled the form saying I want one copy of the Alpine image and I want to run ping good.gl and then I'm handing that off to Swarm and Swarm gives me back a service ID it tells me I got your request and it's um, SN4F38, etc., etc. Okay. Now, if I do, sorry. Oh, what? What? Where did I specify the node? I don't. I I don't know how many nodes I have. I I don't want that to be on a particular node. I just say I want one copy of that. You deal with it. You find a node to run my stuff. At this point, I I did not indicate like the size in RAM or CPU or anything. So it's going to be fairly simple. But um, Imagine that we have a bigger cluster, we have a bunch of things running on the cluster already, and I'm submitting a new job and I say, this is going to need one gig of RAM, then it's going to use that information uh, as well as what's the load on the cluster to find out where to put my, my stuff. But here I like, I don't care, just run that anywhere. So I can, I have a, a bunch of commands with Docker service to see what's going on. I can do Docker service LS. And it tells me uh, this is the, the ID of the service I just created. This is a name that was generated for the service. It's in replicated mode, whatever that means. It tells me that I have one slash one replicas. So it means uh, one replica is currently online over a total of one requested. So that basically means my stuff is up and running and healthy. Uh, OK. And I can do Docker service PS. And then I have to put a service name or a service ID or the first um, characters of a service ID. This is like the uh, same thing with the, with the Docker commands. You can, instead of typing the full ID, you can just type the first letters and that works. So here I can type like SN4 and it's going to show me, yep, um, uh, the, you, you, this is your uh, this is your service. It's running on Node 3, so for reasons, um, Swarm decided that Node 3 would be a, a good place to run that container, and it's been running for two minutes now. Hmm, okay, 
So on node 3, there is a container that is currently pinging Google. So what about this, uh, this little verbose thing, like the, the kind of warning about dash dash detach? Um, this is something new in the latest version of the, of the Docker engine. Um, the something new was added so that you can see exactly what's going on with the deployment. And, and we're going to see that in action. And we are changing the default. So in the process of changing the default, like the, you know, you, when, you, when you change from one behavior to the other, in the versions in the middle, you will have a number of versions when you say, warning, this is going to change in a few months or whatever. So you should start, like, uh, anticipate that change. So that's why there is this little warning here. But we will see that in action very soon. All right, I want to see if my service is really working. Well, I can use Docker service logs. I can do Docker service logs. And then again, I have to put the first few characters uh, of my service ID, so SN4 in my case. When I do that, I get the full output of my container, uh, it looks a lot like what we had for Compose. On the left-hand side, I have the ID of that specific container, like node Davency, instance number one, at node three. And on the right-hand side, that's the output of my ping command. All right, and I have like extra flags, like a dash F, if I want to continue to, uh, to see that, like in tail dash F. I can even put, I think it's dash N, no, it's not dash N, um, dash L, no. Um, hmm. Dash dash tail, sorry. So that way, instead of dumping the whole logs, i just getting the last line. Yes? Yeah. What's, what's Alpine? Yes, excellent question. Um, Alpine is a distro, and it's a distro that a few years ago was this kind of obscure thing for people who want a really small distro, but it was kind of in between two worlds. On the one hand, we have the classic distros like Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, RHEL, CentOS, Gentoo, Arch Linux, etc., etc., uh, Suzy, etc. And on the other side, on the other hand, you had the really small distros uh, that you find on routers and phones and embedded devices like OpenWRT. Um, and in the middle, you had something like Alpine, which is like, hey, look, I'm small and I just need maybe like 10 megs. That, that's small. Yeah, that's small, but it's still bigger than OpenWRT where you can get along with maybe 2 megs. Uh, but Alpine has a package manager. Yeah, but when I'm running on a router, right? don't really care about the package manager, but, but, but. And then eventually, um, the con containers happened, and I can't remember exactly what, what was the, the, the trigger, but at some point, somebody realized, wow, Alpine is actually awesome for containers because it's super small. It has a package manager, so when I need to add a package, uh, I don't have to recompile everything. Uh, since it's very simple, it means that the, the package manager is simple and, and is really, really fast. At some point, I will show you how to install packages uh, in Alpine, and you're like, wow, this is fast. Um, because it doesn't need all the, the complexity. I, I don't want to say complexity because it sounds like negative. It doesn't need the richness of a true uh, full-blown package manager that has like an um, e extremely rich notion of dependencies and recommends and alternatives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so Alpine is this really small distro um, that has a package manager so you can extend things and that happens to be a great fit for containers. And in, I, I think it got a lot of popularity uh, when containers started to be very popular. And I, I, now I'm using Alpine for most of my demos. Um, I wanted to use Ubuntu instead because I was thinking, oh, I don't want to confuse people with Alpine. <laughs> uh, but Ubuntu did not have the ping command. So that's why I'm like, OK, I'm making things even more confusing now. So let's fall back to Alpine because I, I know that this will work. So yeah, Alpine is this small Linux distro that you will see a lot in the world of containers. Does, okay, so does Alpine come with Docker or what? Uh, it's, uh, it's a, in that case, it's an image on the Docker Hub. 
when I do Docker Run Alpine, it's going to connect to the Docker Hub, so the, the public library of available Docker images, and it says, give me the Alpine image, please. And then it downloads the Alpine image from the Docker Hub. The same way, like if I do Docker Run Debian, it's going to download the Debian image that is present on the Docker Hub. And when I run the command for that service, it's Right, um, so I'm, I'm going to show exactly where is that container here. So uh, I'm, I'm seeing like the, my, my service has been mapped or kind of uh, realized uh, by a container that is currently running on Node 3. Now is a good opportunity to connect to Node 3 with SSH and be like, okay, what's going on on Node 3? If I do Docker PS, I see this famous container here. Um, so using the Alpine image, the command is ping good.gl, and it's been running for eight minutes. So I can see that my um, swarm kit service has been mapped, expanded, um, realized by a completely normal classic container. And I can even do like Docker logs on that container, and I will see the same output as we saw before. Yes. How do I find out on which node the thing is running? Um, I can do that in different ways. Like here, I see it as a kind of roundabout way because I do Docker service logs, and in the output of Docker service logs, it's showing me yada 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 at node three. So I know, okay, that one is running on node three. But I can also see that if I do Docker service PS and then I put my service ID and then there is a node, a node column here that tells me that it's on node 3. Okay. Sorry. Oh, right. How did I see it was... Uh, I did Docker PS on node 3. If I, w once I learn, oh, okay, so that container is on node 3, I can go to node 3 with SSH or whatever I want, and then I can do Docker PS, and then I can see, okay, there is a, a classic, completely normal container. Uh, so it, this might be like a fancy swarm kit something service, but at the end of the day, it maps to a normal, ordinary container. Um, a little note, like if you, since Docker service logs is new in Docker Engine 1705, if you are using an older version, uh, then instead of doing Docker service logs, you might have to uh, connect to the machine and, and use Docker logs instead. Um, yeah. Now we want to scale things. So what I'm going to do is like, okay, when I created my service, it told me service ID is SN4, blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to submit a request uh, to, my, um, to my Swarm cluster to say, well, you know the, the service SN4, et cetera, that we created earlier, uh, instead of one copy, I want 10 copies. Please do it. And the way we do that is with Docker service update. I'm going to do Docker service update. Then I put the service ID, so SN4 something something in my case. And then I put the, the options uh, that I want in my change request. In that case, I want 10 copies, so it's dash dash replicas 10. Just to show you, like, if I do dash dash help, you can see here you have like tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of options. Um, and the one that we want to use is dash dash replicas 10. So I do that. and immediately it, it returns and tells me done. Does it? Not, not really. It doesn't tell me it's done, you have 10 copies. It tells me, I got you. I got your request. I know you want me to have 10 copies. And then it's going to work on it. So that's why it returned immediately. And again, that's little warning on dash dash detach. So then it works behind the scene to go from one container to 10 containers. And now, statistically speaking, since we want 10 containers and we have five nodes, we probably will have two containers per node. Let's check if that's true. I'm going to Docker PS 
And yes, when I do Docker PS, I see that now I have those two containers that were started 43 seconds ago. If I look at the logs, now I see like a bunch of um, updates from all these containers. So now I'm running distributed pinging Google as a service. And now there is somebody at Google who is wondering why the hell are there like uh, something, I don't know, like uh, 500 <laughs> ICMP packets per second coming to good.gl. What's going on in Portland, Oregon? OK. It's time to see exactly what's the whole deal about that, that dash dash detach equal false thing. I'm going to do another update to the service, but I'm going to pass the dash dash detach equal false option since I'm invited to do so. So Docker service update, then I put the service ID. Dash dash replicas, let's say 15. And dash dash detach equal false. So now, instead of telling me immediately, job's done, it's going to kind of, uh, technically, it's not staying connected. It's more like checking the, the status of my request. And it's going to tell me what's going on. So you're OK, the, the five extra containers that you want are currently being deployed, being started. Now they're running. And then it's waiting a little bit to make sure that they are stable. So now we have a synchronous mode of operation. Yes. Excellent question, yeah. Right, so the question is, yeah, what's the difference between a container and a service? Sometimes I'm using one word, sometimes I'm using the other. Um, so. A service is a, more, is a more abstract construct. When I was using Compose, in the, in the very first example, when I did Docker Compose Up, there was a 1-1 one, one, uh, mapping. So it's like, oh, there is the RNG service, and it corresponds to one RNG container. And then there is the hasher service, it corresponds to one hasher container. I broke the 1-1 one, one thing when I used Docker Compose Scale, because suddenly I say, let's scale the worker service, and now I, have, I still have like one worker service, but it's scaled to two containers. So the, uh, now my service has multiple containers that are uh, multiple identical uh, containers. And that's also the thing I did here. I still have one service which doesn't have a name. Uh, it's like the, the thing we created, like in my case, it's SN4 or something, something. It's still one service, but now I'm, I, I started with one container, and then five, and 10, and 15. Um, so that, that's, that's how it maps. Uh, can I add additional services? Um, can I add services to a container? Uh, I would say yes and no in the sense that a, a container belongs to one service. So it's, li it's like um, you could imagine a kind of, like those, those are my services, and for each service, there are these containers. This service has these containers. This service has these containers. Um, but at any point, I can create a new service with its own set of containers. And um, the, the containers can talk to each other using the service name. That's what we will see with the load balancing uh, method in a bit. Um, uh, OK, so now I have like 15 containers uh, pinging Google. A little funny thing is that if I'm adding more like if I go probably 18, yeah, that's still that's still fine. Now if I go to let's say 50, it's smart enough to notice that it won't fit on the screen, and so now instead of showing me this status line like that, it's showing me like a brief version, like 
Yay, fancy CLIs. Um, all right. So that's nice, but um, pinging Google is not really useful. We would like to start a service uh, that exposes something, like a service to which I can connect. And um, with normal containers, with that with the docker run dash p, and the dash p option is available as well for docker service create. So here, we are going to start uh, an elastic search service. So my command will be docker service create. So first of all, I'm going to give it a name because like uh, dash dash, uh, I mean, um, SN8 something is not super convenient. So dash dash name search. Then I will do um, dash dash replica seven to say immediately I want seven instances of that. Um, dash p 9200 colon 9200. So here I indicate two port numbers. The first port number is the port number on the host, and the second port number is the port number inside the container. 9200 is the default port for Elasticsearch. So I'm just mapping 9200 outside to 9200 inside. Simplicity. Uh, what else do I need? Uh, dash dash detach equal false. And the image I want to use is Elasticsearch colon 2. Why colon 2? Because if I use Elasticsearch colon latest, or I mean, if I put Elasticsearch full stop, then it expands to Elasticsearch colon latest. And as it happens, the latest version of Elasticsearch requires you to have a config file. Otherwise, it, does, it refuses to start. And I don't want to create a custom image with a config file or whatever. I just want to have Elasticsearch up and running. So I'm going to use an older version of Elasticsearch, which doesn't care about that. So when I do that, now I see I have seven uh, containers. They start in preparing state, which means I'm pulling your image, then starting, and then running. Starting, running, see, like starting is really fast. OK, and once everybody is running, this will wait five seconds to make sure that my containers are not like crashing and restarting. OK, that's it. I have uh, seven Elasticsearch um, nodes running. Yes? Um, it, are, are these like actual Elasticsearch nodes? Yes, they are. It's, it's not a seven node Elasticsearch cluster. It's, it's seven independent Elasticsearch. But yes, they are. Yeah. Is there a volume sharing between the seven nodes? Is there not one data source? Um, is there is no volume sharing, is what you asked? Yes, it wasn't like the Elasticsearch. So if I import something in one of the Elasticsearch, right. Um, a copy of it? Or is so just, yeah, just to clarify, in that case, I just get seven fully independent copies of Elasticsearch. So it's, it's not really a seven nodes Elasticsearch cluster. It's just like I get seven independent Elasticsearch nodes for reasons that I will explain just after. Um, and each has its own independent storage. So that's the, the only reason why I'm using Elasticsearch is because Elasticsearch, um, when you go to the, the default API port and you just get the default API route so slash, it sends you a small JSON document um, to say, hello, this is Elasticsearch, and I'm version like 245, et cetera, et cetera. And it generates a superhero name. And it's, it's a randomly generated name, which means that my seven uh, Elasticsearch instance all have a different name here. Uh, so here, I'm, I'm doing like curl localhost 9200. So I'm, I'm just like making a request to my Elasticsearch um, service. And the question would be, um, which of my seven Elasticsearch uh, is currently sending that to me? Well, if I do the request multiple times, we will get a hint because each time I get a different name here. And after a given time, it will loop back to what it was in the beginning. If this is not clear, I'm going to use JQ. Uh, JQ is the JSON Swiss Army knife. I'm going to tell it, hey, I, I just want to see the name field in, in that little JSON document. Uh, and remove all that curl thing. 
All right, now I want to run that maybe like a bunch of times, like for i in sec110, do that. Okay, so you can see like, okay, one request, two requests, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it loops back to the beginning. So when I connect to port 9200, I'm connecting to something that sends the requests to my seven Elasticsearch uh, containers uh, in round robin fashion. I'm connecting to a load balancer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, when I, when I expose, when I publish a service, um, SwarmKit will automatically set up a load balancer for that service. And that load balancer will do simple um, round, rob round robin on, on TCP connections. Uh, that like cycle, testing, all right. So this load balancer, uh, we have a fancy name for it. We call it like the TCP routing mesh. Um, the, the whole idea behind that is it's kind of a novel idea in the sense that very often when we think load balancing, we're thinking, okay, I have clients, load balancer, and backends. So I send a request to the load balancer, and it goes to the backend, and I have the load balancer in the middle. Here, we are doing something slightly different. We have a load balancer running on each node, so that instead of doing like one hop to the load balancer and one hop to the backend, you do one hop to the local load balancer, which is fast because localhost is really, really fast. And then from that load balancer, we go to the backend. Um, so that also improves reliability because usually your, your load balancer is a, it's a single point of failure in the sense that if it goes down, then no more traffic. But here, since you connect to a local load balancer, if the load balancer goes down, since it's local, it means that the local machine is down. So it's the, if the local machine is down, the client is down as well. So th there is no problem of the load balancer being down. Um, uh, okay, and that's also helped with scalability because if you have like 1,000 nodes making requests to some service, instead of having 1,000 nodes kind of all uh, storming uh, a load balancer, each node has its own load balancer. So the more you scale, the more load balancing, the more load balancers you have. Uh, under the hood, what exactly is this load balancer? It's using IPVS. IPVS uh, is old, and I say that in a good way. It's, it's old in the sense that it's been in the kernel. So first, it's in kernel, so it's really, really fast. Uh, it's been around for a really long time, like kernel 2.4, so that's probably a decade or something like that. Uh, a lot of really high traffic websites run IPVS uh, for their core stuff, like um, Facebook was running IPVS until recently, and recently they announced, hey, we found something even faster, and everybody was like, what? Um, but uh, IPVS is, it's, it's, it's in another of those things, a little bit like IP tables, like it's, uh, um, every, a lot of people know that, okay, that's IP table is great, but a lot of people also hope that they will never have to deal with it because uh, it's not extremely user-friendly. But once in a while, you will need to go to your IP tables expert to ask them, how do I, um, how do I add an IP tables rules to block that specific traffic or do this or that? Uh, IPVS is a little bit like that, but it's even worse because finding somebody who knows IPVS uh, is like looking for a five-legged unicorn. Um, so here, when, when SwarmKit was um, developed, the idea was, can we get, um, let's say, the, the best uh, load balancer that money can get us, except it's open source, so you don't even have to pay money, um, and how can we hide all the complexity associated to that uh, so that it's easy to use? And th that was the, the whole... Uh, motive that drove the, the choice of IPVS. Um, if, you, if you are familiar with IPVS and you want to see exactly what's going on, you can use IPVS, ADM, and all those tools, and you will see, yep, the Docker created a bunch of IPVS load balancers. But if you don't know IPVS, you don't need to learn anything about it. That's the whole point. All right. So this is how we manage traffic inside the cluster. Now, how do we manage traffic 
coming from outside? Like, what if I want to connect to my Elasticsearch service from outside, like from, from this machine here? Well, as it happens, each node runs a load balancer. So I can connect to any node on port 9200. Like, I can take my little piece of paper, and I can put the IP address of any random node. Uh, let's say node 4 on port 9200, and I get like this output. Now there is a little funny thing. If, if, you, hit, if you hit reload, you won't see the name change un only after a bunch of requests. Uh, this is because of the keep alive for HTTP connections in the browser. So it's super confusing. You're like, well, but browsers. OK, I, great. So, you, so the short version is you can connect to any node uh, when you need to access a service. Um, so the, the best way to handle that depends on uh, what kind of infrastructure you have. Um, if you are running on a cloud, you can put an elastic load balancer in front of your nodes, and then you connect a load balancer and it deals with it. If you are running on like good old physical machines, you can use virtual IPs and have one or multiple virtual IPs IPs, sorry, floating between the nodes. And if you have any of that and you don't want to add extra complexity, you can also put all or a subset of your machines uh, in, in the DNS with a round robin record so that, for instance, when you connect to um, uh, elasticsearch.mycompany.com, uh, it, it, the, um, that name corresponds to multiple IP addresses and then automatically the client the clients will load balance themselves uh, on those machines. Now, what about HTTP traffic? Uh, the thing with HTTP traffic is that very often you want to have multiple services uh, behind different virtual hosts, but you can only have one service on port 80. So in that case, you will need to put a reverse proxy that will act as a virtual host switch on port 80. And that thing will be responsible for handing off traffic to the right service. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, now I want to show a pattern that is pretty useful because this demonstrates one of the um, nicenesses of the Docker API. Um, I'm going to visualize what's going on in my cluster with a third party visualization tool. So it's, um, so I'm going to the home directory and it's git clone github.com slash docker samples slash uh, docker swarm visualizer. In that directory, I have a compose file here. So without even thinking, I can do docker compose up dash d and it's going to look in the compose file and it's going to like pull images and build etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, i want to show that thing so first so that we have a kind of visualization of what's going on in the cluster but also to show like one it, this is one of the really nice things with the, the, the with the docker api you can write tools that will interact with the docker api in that case it's just visualization but you could have a tool to show like memory usage or what containers are the ones using the most cpu or pretty much anything you want and those tools are uh, portable from one cluster to the other and the tool that we are going to use um, could be running on a cluster of any size um, and any Docker version, and it's the only thing it needs is Docker API access. Okay, so it's building a bunch of things, and now it's up and running. If I do Docker Compose PS, it's telling me that, okay, we have something running on port 8080. Fine, so let's try that. I'm going to connect to port 8080 of my node. And that's the, the visualizer. It shows me that I have five nodes. It shows like all the, the containers running. So the, in blue, I have like the seven search containers. And in pink, purple-ish, I have my 
distributed Google pinging thing. And the, f the, the extra fun part is that this visualizer runs in a container. So I can have my, my management tools in containers themselves, and they have access to the Docker API. Um, OK. All right, so now it's time to get Docker coins actually running in, in, in Swarm. Uh, but first, we are going to get rid of the Pinger and the Elasticsearch service. Uh, so if I do Docker service ls, I see them here. If I do ls-q, I get only the, the IDs. And if I pipe xargs docker service rm, that's some Unix scriptory, that means run docker service rm and pass as arguments uh, the output of this command. So that means docker service rm, this and this. Boom. And if I look at my visualization, you can see that all the services have disappeared. The visualization, though, is still running because the visualization here is not a service itself. It, it has been started as a normal container. So it was not wiped out by docker service rm. Perfect. Let's run Docker coins on Swarm. So th that's here that we will see the, the whole like build, ship, and run model of Docker and, and what exactly it means. Mm. So first question is, why do we need to ship the images? Because w in the beginning, when we started the app on No1 with Docker Compose Up, we didn't need to ship. We, we've seen the build, like there was a bunch of output, right? pulling images and building, and then it was running, but we didn't need to ship. Yeah, we didn't need to ship because there was only one machine. So I didn't need to ship from node 1 to node 1. But now I'm going to build uh, my application somewhere, and then I need to ship it to all the nodes so that it can run there. So that's why I need to ship. The easiest way to ship uh, container images around is to use a Docker registry. The Docker registry is a little bit like an FTP server or an S3 bucket. Like it's, a, it's a store for Docker images. Um, it's, it's the thing that powers the Docker Hub. When, when you do Docker run Ubuntu and it's downloading the Ubuntu image, it's downloading the Ubuntu image from a registry. So what we will do is that we will uh, build our Docker coins uh, container images. Then we will put them on a registry. And then we will tell the other nodes, hey, go and get the, the image uh, from that registry. We will build on node 1, just because node 1 has been our common center so far. So let's continue that way. Uh, then we will tag the images. So th that's how we move images around. When you want to put an image on a registry, you tag it. I, I could almost say, rename, except that rename is not, uh, is not exactly accurate because um, an image can have multiple tags. So we are going to say uh, this image, instead of being Docker coins worker, it's going to be localhost colon 5000 slash Docker coins worker, which means it's an image that lives on a registry located on localhost port 5000 and is named Docker coins worker. And if you've never used um, Docker registries before, you're probably wondering, like, what the hell is this? What's going on? So we are going to see a little example. We are going to take an image from the Docker Hub, and we are going to put it on our registry first so that you can see exactly what, what we're going to do. So uh, when you want to run the registry, you have many options. Uh, one of the easiest options is to use the Docker Hub. Um, so the, the Docker Hub is... Uh, um, a SaaS, you could say. Uh, you, it's, a, it, it's a registry operated by Docker Inc. Uh, you can create an account for free and put images there if you want. Um, we could use a self-hosted commercial registry, like uh, DTR, so that, that's the Docker Trusted Registry, which is part of DDC, which is Docker Data Center, and that's a lot of uh, acronyms. Um, 
But DTR is a commercial product. I don't want to do demos of commercial products. I will be eternally grateful if a few of you eventually end up uh, acquiring commercial solutions from Docker Inc. because otherwise they won't be able to continue to pay for my salary uh, at Vitam Eternam. Um, but that's not what I'm here for. Uh, so we are going to use the open source registry. And the open source registry, by the way, is exactly the same component that powers the Docker Hub and that powers the Docker Trusted Registry. The key difference is that when you run the open source registry, you're just running like that one component. And when you run, for instance, the Trusted Registry, you have that component, but you also have like a user directory and permissions and a garbage collection system and security scanning and integration with CI and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here we just want to have like a, a nice place to put our images and not all the other features, so easy. Uh, so running a registry is as easy as Docker run registry, and then you get the registry. Uh, there is a little trick here. When you, when you put images on a registry, and then you tell Docker, get images from that registry, uh, that registry has to use TLS with valid certificates. Uh, if you've been deploying certificates before, you're probably being like, oh no, we have to, how, how are we going to get certificates in just a few minutes and get that up and running? That, that's going to be painful. So there is a trick. Uh, if you are using a local registry, so on localhost or 127000, then you don't need TLS because the Docker engine is paranoid, but it's not that paranoid to require TLS on localhost. So the trick is that we are going to run the registry on localhost. But then if you've been doing some networking, you can be like, wait a minute, we have five nodes. So let's say that registry is running on node one. Uh, from node one, I can connect to the registry on localhost, but on node two, three, four, five, if I connect on localhost, I, I can't possibly be talking to, re to the registry except if I publish it the same way that I published Elasticsearch before. When I published Elasticsearch, I said, I want Elasticsearch to be available on port 9200 on all the nodes of my cluster. I'm going to do the same thing with the registry. I'm going to publish it on port 5000, 5, which means that on any node, if I connect to localhost 5000, I'm actually talking to a load balancer that will route my request to my registry. Don't worry too much if that feels a little bit confusing. We are going to see that in action uh, shortly. So this is the command we want to do. So docker service create. So I, I want to run my registry. Uh, dash dash name registry, just, just because I like to put a nice name. Uh, dash dash publish, that's the long hand version of dash p. 5,000 colon 5,000. So again, by default, the registry uh, container will be listening on port 5,000. So here I'm saying I want to uh, publish port 5,000 on my nodes to port 5,000 in the registry container. And the image I want to run is registry colon 2. I have to put colon 2 because I want registry v2, otherwise I, I get the v1 protocol. I do that. And a few seconds later, I have a registry container running somewhere. Um, where exactly? Well, we could look at the visualizer, and it will tell us, yep, on, on node one, I have a registry up and running here. Great. Um, and now if I connect to any node on port 5000, I'm talking to my registry. So at first, it looked like, well, no, like no, nothing is responding. That's just because the registry is not being super friendly and like it, it displays nothing by default. But if I go to slash v2 slash underscore something like that, no, um, I should know, yeah, catalog. Slash v2 slash underscore catalog. Then it tells me, Repository is an empty list, which means currently my registry is empty. But instead of localhost, I can ask the same question on node 2, node 3, or whatever. Um, and each time, I'm hitting a load balancer that routes my traffic to the registry. OK, so how do I put an image on that registry? 
we are going to do that as an example with the BusyBox image. Uh, BusyBox is a tiny Linux distro, even smaller. Well, it's not exactly a distro. It's not even a distro. It's a kind of Unix Swiss Army knife uh, that you find very often on routers and phones and embedded systems. Um, and it's probably the smallest yet still useful image on the Docker Hub. So I'm going to do Docker pull BusyBox. That means download the BusyBox image from the Docker Hub. OK, now I have the BusyBox image. If I do Docker images, I have a bunch of things. And yep, BusyBox is here. Now I'm going to add a tag to BusyBox. So I'm, it's like adding a new, it's like when adding a git tag, or it's like creating a link, if you will. So Docker tag BusyBox, localhost colon 5000 slash BusyBox. And now if I run Docker images, you will see that um, I still have my BusyBox image. Uh, its ID is C75, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But I also have like the same image, has another name, localhost colon 5000 slash BusyBox. Again, you can think of that as a hard link, but that probably is the, the best metaphor. And now I can do Docker push localhost 5000 slash BusyBox. Docker push means I want to upload that image somewhere. And uh, when you do that, the, the engine is going to look at the name that you're trying to push. Uh, if in that case, since I have host colon port, it's going to realize, oh, you want to push that to the registry on localhost 5000. Fine, let's do it. That was a really tiny image, so the push was like almost instant. Um, and now I'm going to execute my curl command from a few minutes ago. Uh, curl localhost 5000 slash v2 slash underscore catalog. And instead of having an empty list, now my registry, my self-hosted registry, tells me I have one image, I have BusyBox. Why did I have to tag it? What, what happens if I try Docker push BusyBox? Well, if I try Docker push BusyBox, internally it expands as library slash BusyBox, which expands to the address of the Docker Hub slash library slash BusyBox. And basically, it will try to push uh, over the official BusyBox image. And if I try to do that, um, yeah, the push refers to repository. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Push BusyBox. And basically, it says access denied. Because that would, be, that would be like trying to overwrite the official BusyBox image on the Docker Hub. So that's why it, yeah? So could I directly do Docker, Docker push localhost 5000? So if I do like um, Docker push, um, sorry, like uh, Ubuntu, for instance, is going to tell me I don't have an Ubuntu. I, I don't have localhost 5000 slash Ubuntu, so I, I can't do that. However, if I Docker tag Ubuntu localhost 5000 Ubuntu, then that works. Uh, th this this sometimes is a little bit confusing because the tag of the image contains the address of the registry. Um, so that I, th I think that's the the most kind of. Uh, cognitive dissonance generating part. It's like, why? So it's just like a convention. Um, all right. OK. Well, so now we have to do the build and ship part. Like, I want to build my Docker Coins application. And then I want to push it um, to the registry. Um, so I'm going to go back to Doc, uh, sorry, to orchestration workshop Docker coins. Uh, I'm going to build uh, my images with Docker Compose build 
And this is going to be super fast because remember we, we built that app before and Docker has a caching system. So it's realizing, well, I, I, we built that thing before and you didn't change a single line of code. So I can zoom through the build process. Now, if I look at Docker images, my images are named Docker coins underscore web UI, Docker coins underscore RNG, et cetera, et cetera. I want to re-tag them so that they are localhost colon 5000 slash web UI, et cetera. So I'm going to do a for loop for service in um, web UI RNG hasher worker do uh, Docker tag. Docker coins underscore dollar service, localhost 5000 slash dollar service. Done. OK. So now if I look at Docker images, each of my images has a, let's duplicate, if, if you will, but that references to the, um, the registry. Now I have to push that to the registry. So I'm going to do almost the same loop for service in web UI RNG hasher worker do docker push uh, localhost 5000 slash dollar service done. And there we are happily pushing our images to the registry. It's going to take a couple of minutes because even if it's a local registry, uh, there are still like a few hundreds of bytes to, to push. So questions while this is pushing? Oh, yeah, why do I have multiple lines um, for, for each image? Because the images are broken down in layers. In that specific scenario, um, you, like when you have a Docker file, each line in a Docker file will correspond to one layer. And the, the Docker file starts with from that image. And so if that image itself has multiple layers, it, it adds up. So that's why here uh, you, you can see something um, here, it, this means my worker image is made from uh, one, two, three, four, five, eight layers. So some of those layers are unique to this image, and then you see pushed, and some layers are shared with other images, and then you see mounted from blah, blah, blah. In that case, you can see that the, um, the worker image shares a common history with the RNG image. Yeah, because they are both using uh, a, a Python base. So, um, exactly, it works out the differences and push only the, the, the parts that are unique to this image. And here you can see mounted from Hasher because even though Hasher is a Ruby service, it, 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 it shares a common base with the Python service because they are both built on top of Alpine, I believe. Um, so you, you save up um, on, on transfer, etc. Okay, so now in my registry, I should have all those images and I'm going to prove it um, always with my curl localhost 5000 slash v2 underscore catalog. Now, in addition to Busybox, I have Asher, RNG, Web UI, Worker. Okay. Now we want to start the application with Docker service create, but we will want all our containers to be able to talk to each other. And to enable that, we need an overlay network. An overlay network is a private network uh, for your application. Uh, out of curiosity, who is familiar with the concept of VLANs? Uh, a few people. So for, for those people, you can think of overlay networks just like VLANs, except instead of being Ethernet in Ethernet, it's Ethernet on top of IP. For people who don't know what VLANs are, um, you, you, could, you can think as overlay networks as a private network for a specific application, um, 
but that can span over multiple machines, or a little bit like a VPN connecting all the containers of an application, but instead of being a, a VPN often as a kind of central point, in that case, it's entirely peer-to-peer, -peer, like the, the containers can talk directly to each other without having to go to a central node. And also, generally, VPNs are encrypted. Overlay networks sometimes are encrypted, sometimes not. It depends on, on the use case. Um, OK, so we are going to create that network with Docker network create dash dash driver overlay. This is important because if you don't put it, you're going to create a, a local network, not an overlay network. Docker coins. And now if I do Docker network ls, I will see my Docker coins network. I see that it's using the overlay driver as opposed, for instance, to a few other um, networks. Like, for instance, when I started the Docker Swarm visualizer, uh, Compose created a network for it automatically. But since I was running like Compose locally and everything, it's like it's, it's creating a local network using the bridge driver instead of an overlay network. OK, so now I have this private network for my Docker Coins app. Great. Can I extend the overlay network outside of the Docker host? Yes, that's the whole point of the overlay network. Uh, when you create an overlay network, it, it shows up on all the nodes of your cluster. Oh, like outside of my cluster? Um, kind of. <laughs> uh, you can, but um, let me think about the, the, the best explanation for that. If you are using the default overlay driver, you can, but it's going to be a lot of tinkering. Because if, if you like open that and look exactly how it's working, it's using VXLAN, which is like an industry standard protocol. It's using the VXLAN implementation in the kernel. So you can see all those networks like uh, on, on using standard tools like IP, etc. Uh, so you can kind of uh, break open the overlay network and say, I want this extra interface to be connected to this overlay network. But you will need to manually feed uh, the neighboring tables of VXLAN. So you will need to do a lot of manual tinkering uh, to make that work. Uh, so if you want to do that, for instance, if you want to have an overlay network, uh, but you have some, uh, let's say, a bunch of physical machines, or maybe you have some black box device that needs to access to the, to the network, um, you can either use a different driver, like a lot of network vendors like Cisco, etc., uh, have made special drivers that interface with their equipment uh, so that you can do exactly that kind of stuff, like mix containers and traditional um, equipments, machines, hosts, VMs, etc. Uh, because you need, so why you need that extra complexity? Just because of like IP addressing, MAC address uh, allocation. Um, like w as long as it's just containers, Docker will take care of uh, allocating IP addresses, um, keeping track of which IP addresses are in use, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But as soon as you add other things, um, you need to make sure that you know which IP addresses are in use, which are um, uh, available. So you, the default driver has some basic things for that, like you can reserve a bunch of addresses, you can do some stuff like that, and, and then you can do a little bit of manual hacking. Um, but if you want to go farther, you will typically want to have a, a custom overlay driver. Does that answer the question? OK, thanks. So now we are going to start our Docker Coins app. So we are, we are going to start with an easy service, the Redis service. So Docker service create, uh, dash dash name Redis, dash dash network Docker Coins to say I want that to be on, on that specific network, and Redis to say I want the Redis image. And that's it. And next up, we need to start the four other services, the, so the, the images that we had pushed to the registry. I'm going to use a little for loop again. So for service in um, 
RNG, Hasher, Walker, WebUI do um, Docker service create dash dash name dollar service dash dash network Docker coins. And then the image that I want to use will be localhost 5000 slash dollar service. Done. OK, so now the everything is currently starting. Yeah, I forgot to put dash dash d touch equal false, which would have uh, synchronously waited for each thing to come up. Um, so now I will, yeah. Is there something to automate that, like some kind of compose file? Yes. The only reason why I'm showing the steps manually is to really understand what's going on. But as soon as we will have the app up and running, we're like, all right, now let's automate because. <laughs> Um, so my app is up and running, uh, so I would like to connect to the web UI, except I can't because at this point the web UI is not exposed. Let's check that things are working anyway, like I'm going to do docker service logs, walker. Yep, it looks like it's working. I, I see the, the normal output of the walker, that's great. So I'm going to publish uh, the web UI, I'm going to plumb it into the network, like make it available from outside. I could destroy and recreate it, or I could just tell to SwarmKit, hey, you remember the web UI that we started earlier? I want to update the service definition. I want to publish it. For that, I do Docker service update web UI. And then how do I want to change it? Well, I want to publish add. Port 8000 on the cluster should be mapped to port 80 in the container. Oh, and I forgot to do the dash dash detach equal file false. Uh, if I do that like this, yeah. So when I do that, there is um, something quite interesting. Well, first let's let's see the output. Let's see that it really worked and that the app is really running uh, there. And. This is yet one more reminder that I can't do front-end stuff because that's not exactly what it did. Like This should be zero, and then it should stay to zero. I'm going to just reload that page. <laughs> and I reload that page. We see exactly what we had in the very beginning, so the, the Docker coins app running on a single node with what one instance of each service and doing f about four hashes per second. Great. Now, um, if I look at the web UI uh, service, if I do docker service ps web UI, I'm uh, going to zoom a little bit so that it's more clear. Um, and it's, it's OK if you can't read exactly the, the output. What the only thing that's important to see is that I have two lines in the output, and that one is running, and the other one is shut down. Why do I have two, line, two lines? Uh, these correspond to the two versions of my web UI service. The one that is running is the one with the exposed port. The one that is shut down is the one without the exposed port. Uh, that's the original version. When you update a service definition um, with almost every, every possible change, um, it will create a new version of the service and like destroy the old version and create the new version, even if it's a change that arguably could be done on the fly. Like here, I'm just opening a port. So normally, I should be able to do that on the fly. There is no solid reason for uh, destroying the old container and creating a new container. So why do we do that? It's for consistency, because there are some changes that will require you to restart the container some changes that don't, and some changes where it depends. You could be like, what do you mean it depends? I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that you have a memory quota on a service. It's one gig. And then you realize that the service needs more memory. So you docker service update my service, like dash dash memory limit, two gigs. What's going to happen? Um, well. If you, if you are on a machine that has lots and lots and lots of memory available, then the service 
could just increase the memory quota and you're good. You don't need to restart it or whatever. However, if the service is running on a machine that is almost full already, like there is just like maybe 100 megs available, when you increase the memory quota, the only way to make that happen is to move the service to a different node that has more memory available. So when you increase the, the memory quota, what you could see is, well, that's weird. I had, let's say, 10 replicas, and seven of them were apparently restarted and moved, and three of them weren't. What the heck is going on? So to have consistency, we decided, OK, each time that you're making a change, uh, we are going to restart the service. So why? Because imagine you're testing that on your local machine. So you have a one node cluster. So when you have a one node cluster, obviously the service is never going to be moved to a different node because you have only one node. So you could be testing your code locally and maybe you're testing some fancy auto-scaling policy or whatever and you would be increasing and reducing the memory size and you say, yeah, everything works great because the service is never restarted. But then as soon as you go to production, you would see random services being restarted. And for you, the, 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 the user, the developer, it would seem random. It's like, why are some of my services restarted while the others are not restarted? There has to be a bug somewhere. And my code runs perfectly locally. So to avoid that problem, we decided, well, if it might be restarted sometimes, then we want it to be restarted every time so that you avoid that discrepancy between local dev and cluster production. So that's why in that case you publish a port and even though there is no apparent reason for restarting the service, we say let's restart it, any let's restart it anyway uh, so that you don't end up running into surprises when one day random stuff restarts. Does that make sense? Kind of, hopefully. Yeah. Um, right. Um. Uh. Now it's time to scale up the application. So I'm, we're going to scale uh, the worker. So that's the equivalent of Docker Compose scale worker equal 10, but uh, using SwarmKit. Uh, so Docker service update worker dash dash replicas 10. And after a few seconds, we see this graph doing exactly the same thing as before, uh, which is to uh, like peak a little bit and then be capped at 10 hashes per second. And finally, we are going to be able to do the, the very one thing for which we, we came to this cluster and everything. Uh, we are going to scale the RNG service. So here we could do like a Docker service update dash dash, uh, sorry, Docker service update uh, RNG dash dash replicas five, and we would get five copies. But that's not what we want. Because what if for some reason the, the scheduler decides to put the five copies on the same machine? Remember, uh, we want to have one copy per node because the whole entropy thing, blah, blah, blah. So we want in some way to have exactly one copy per node. And there is a special scheduler for that um, called the, the global scheduling strategy. Um, and so you can, uh, w when you enable that, you're telling to SwarmKit, I want exactly one copy of that container uh, on each node. And it's going to be dynamic in the sense that if you add more nodes in the future, the service will be started on these nodes. If you remove nodes, then that's fine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, changing the scheduling strategy is one of the very few operations where you have to destroy and recreate the service. You, you can't just do Docker service update, enable global scheduling. You have to destroy and recreate. Um, the reason why, like short version, is that when you update a service, the update uh, is managed by a scheduler. And so the, the scheduler is the thing responsible for doing the diff, if you will, between what do you have, what do you want. OK, the steps to go there are doing this and this and this. But when you switch to global scheduling, you switch to a different scheduler. So you, you can't do a diff between the two things because the, the, the scheduler is the thing responsible for the diff. Fine, let's destroy uh, the RNG service, Docker service RM RNG. 
When you do that, immediately the graph here goes to zero because the workers and everything is kind of stopped. It's, it's trying to connect to RNG, but there is no RNG no more, so that, that doesn't work. And now we are going to recreate it. So Docker service create dash dash name RNG dash dash network Docker coins. Um, dash dash mode global. And I give the image name, well, let's say also like dash dash detach force this time. And my image name is localhost port 5000 slash RNG. Am I forgetting anything? Uh, that looks like it. All right. So now RNG is running. Um, the graph is not going to recover immediately. Uh, where is it? Here. It's going to take some time because if we look at the worker code, there is a, a big try accept um, section. And so when there is any kind of error, like cannot connect to RNG, it, it waits 10 seconds and then it goes to the whole loop again. So we, we have to wait until this 10 seconds delay is over and then it's going to try again. And that's what we're seeing, seeing now. So, yep, wonderful. And it did not start immediately at the full speed because this 10 seconds wait, I it's not synchronized. Like you don't have 10 workers all waiting at the same time for 10 seconds and suddenly the 10 seconds delay is over and everybody tries again. It's more like the, those periods are staggered over time. So you, uh, you have to wait like when one 10 seconds period is over, you have a bunch of well, one worker like connecting and then when the 10 seconds period for another worker is over, that worker connects and so on and so on. Okay, so now we are using the full power of five RNG services. And if we are so inclined, we can uh, add more replicas to Worker. And as we do that, um, the graph will increase a little bit. And this time, it will be stuck to 50, because when we had one RNG, we were stuck to 10. So now that we have five RNGs, we are stuck to 50. It looks like RNG is the bottleneck in this application. Right. Questions so far? No. So before going to like the um, metrics, logging, etc., one good question is, how did I make this demo app to be Swarm ready? Like, how did I change my code? Because I think I mentioned in the beginning, this is a demo app I wrote two years ago when Swarm did not exist at all. Even the idea of Swarm was not there yet. So how did I change my code between my initial version two years ago and today to run on Swarm? Let's have a look. So I'm going to inspect the Docker coins directory. Yep, that's where we are. And I'm going to do some, uh, is it git log? Yeah, git log dash p. So show me, that's to show the diff between versions. Uh, but I'm going to say, show me the diff um, since July the 4th in 2015. Why this date? Because um, July the 4th is my birthday. And also this is after the changes I did to the, uh, after the, f the first version, basically. I, I want to exclude all the initial changes and I want to see like what changed since July 2015 in that part of the code. Um, so if I do that, I see, whoops. Um, since, yeah, if I, More like this. Okay, so I see changes in YAML files. So I'm going to exclude that with that fancy git option. So this means exclude all the changes to YAML files. Then I'm going to see changes in HTML file. Okay, so I, I don't care about the changes in the HTML files either. So let's get rid of them as well. 
Now I see changes in Docker files. OK, let's get rid of them as well. And now there is no change. So when between the initial version I wrote two years ago and the version that we're running today, there is not a single line of code that has been changed. That's pretty interesting uh, because, um, yeah, we would only change compose files, we changed the HTML file because uh, at some point I was uh, craving for social media attention, so I had this idea of putting a tweet this button here, and when you click on it, it like suggests that you uh, uh, tweet things, um, but uh, how do I get back here? Um, the Docker files, because at some point I switched from the default Python and Ruby images to the slim version of those images that are based on Alpine, and that's it. I never changed the code itself. Um, and by the way, if we take the images that I built almost two years ago and we try to run it today, they still run. So how, like, how was I able to do that since I unfortunately don't have a way to predict the future, otherwise I would like play some lottery or something like that and stop working? Um, I used like 12 factors apps principles, so hard code nothing. Um, service discovery was done using those DNS names that I showed in the beginning, like when I want to connect to Redis, I connect to the name Redis, and back then, two years ago, we didn't have like this fancy swamp kit load balancer, but I could implement load balancers with containers. So in my stack, I could have Redis uh, being um, a kind of load balancer or proxy or director to the actual Redis service and so on and so on. So I was able to abstract the plumbing, load balancing, service discovery, uh, using different concepts. At first it was links, then it was ambassadors, and today it's services, but the code itself is completely oblivious to those details. Of course, existing applications might require more changes, uh, but what I want to show is that uh, there is nothing um, swarm-specific uh, in, in the code that we are running. Somebody asked, hey, can we automate that with Compose? And the answer is yes. And uh, and we're going to see how exactly. Um, so, to do that, we're going to use Compose File version 3. Uh, it's almost the same thing as a Compose File v2. The, the Oh yeah, first, let's clean up everything. Uh, so we're going to use the same command as earlier, like docker service ls-q, pypixargs, docker service rm, before I do that, I'm just going to show the, um, uh, the visualizer here. I have like a bunch of services, the walkers, hasher, rng on, on each node, etc., etc. Um, as I run this command, almost instantly in the visualizer, everything is gone. Good. So how do we automate this deployment? So the, the same way that Compose lets us encode Docker run parameters, uh, Compose with the Compose file v3 uh, allows us to, to encode Docker service create. For instance, uh, the registry that I created that way with Docker service create, that dash publish, registry, uh, this can be encoded by the following stack file. Sometimes you will see about stack file or compose file. Um, this is because the way we deploy those compose file is with a command which is docker stack deploy. So some people call them stack files, but a stack file is just a compose file with at least version 3, the same thing. So this says, okay, this is a compose file version 3. It has the following services. Well, it has just one service, registry, and it's using the registry image, and it's exposing a port. And this compose file has the same meaning as this um, command. We have uh, so th those stack files. Those stack files, excuse me, in the registry are in the stacks directory. Um, registry is exactly the one I was showing in the slides. And the way we are uh, deploying that is with Docker stack deploy. So I do docker stack deploy. I'm going to call it registry. It's not very original, but it's easy. Uh, dash dash compose file. 
registry.yaml. And so when I do that, it's creating a network for my application, even if it's not strictly necessary in that case, because my registry service is alone in, in its stack, but it's still creating a network. And then it's creating the registry service there. If I do um, Docker service ls, I see that I have a, a service named registry underscore registry. So if we break that down, that part is the stack name, and that part here is the service name. So it's the registry service in the registry stack. And if I do uh, my favorite curl command on localhost 5000 v2 catalog, it's telling me that it's empty. Uh, it's empty because I recreated a new service. That so all the, the images that had been stored before are gone. If I look in the visualizer, I will see, yep, my registry is back here. Perfect. So now I have a registry. So I, I could um, build and push my Docker coin services. And here, to make that simpler, uh, the key is to have both a build and an image uh, instruction in the Compose file. Let's see exactly what that means. Uh, where is it? Right. If you just have an image, that means I want to use that image from the Docker file. If you have a just build, it means I want to build using that directory, and then the, the image should be named um, project underscore service. If you have both build and image, this means it should be built using uh, the Docker file in this directory, and the image should be named as indicated by the image configuration tag. So for instance, if you build a Docker file that has that, it's going to build using the www directory, and the image will be named myregistry.company.net port 5000 slash webfront. So it will already be pre-tagged, ready to push. Let's try this just to see exactly how it works. I can do, uh, so here I have a dockercoins.yml file and we will see just after exactly what's in that file, but I'm going to do the, the two-step process to push and build. So, uh, sorry, build and push, that's better in that, 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 in that direction. That was strong coffee. <laughs> so docker compose dash f to indicate which file, because if you don't put the dash f flag, it's going to look for docker compose.yml. Here I say, no, no, I don't want to use docker compose.yml, I want to use dockercoins.yml, and I want to build. And now you can see it says successfully tagged. Instead of seeing successfully tagged uh, dockercoins underscore web UI, it says successfully tagged 127.001.5000 slash web UI. OK, and now I can do docker compose dash f dockercoins.yml push. And there we go, it's pushing. And while it's pushing, I want to show exactly what is in that stack file. Uh, so it's going to be stacks. And if I look in Docker Coins YAML, it's almost the same thing as the compost file we had earlier, except here, the images, so at, at first it, it, it seems super weird, but I'm going to break that down and you'll be like, ah, great. So for each service, the image is blah, 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 slash RNG, colon, blah, blah, blah. Let's look at the first blah, blah, blah. It says dollar registry dash one, two, seven, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine that this is just dollar registry, dollar registry slash RNG. That would mean just use the environment variable dollar registry, but we did not set uh, dollar registry. Yep. So that's why we have the dash something. Dash something is used to indicate a default value for an environment variable. Uh, if you've never seen that before, this is not something invented by Compose. This is like standard POSIX uh, shell environment variable substitution. This is to say if registry is set use it. If it's not set, then use 127.0.0.1 colon 5000. 
It's the same thing for dollar tag here. If you have set the dollar tag variable, then it's going to use that as the tag for the image. But if you haven't set it, it's going to use the default tag of latest. And we have that for every single image. So the, the point of that is that if you don't set that variable, you can just like docker compose build, docker compose push, and it's going to push to the local registry. And if you're not happy with that choice, like if you want to push to a different registry, you just do export registry equal blah, 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 and that's it. All right. Um, so meanwhile, all our images were successfully pushed to the registry, so that's great. I can once again use my curl command to confirm that the images are in the registry indeed. And finally, I can deploy the stack. So again, I, I'm using like the same, do the same docker stack deploy command. Docker stack deploy. I'm going to call it docker coins dash dash compose file docker coins .yaml. You can see how it gives us a little warning like ignoring unsupported options build. Because when you deploy a stack, it doesn't know what to do with this build option, so it just ignores it. And conversely, if we were to use docker compose up, it would tell us, hey, you have some options. I don't know what to do. Like It doesn't know what to do with this deploy option here and this other deploy option here. And you probably have guessed that those options are specific to the docker stack deploy command. This indicates I want the RNG service to use the global scheduler. This indicates I want the worker to be initially scaled with 10 workers. And indeed, if I go back here, um, you can see that my Docker coin stack is now up and running with RNG being deployed in using the global scheduler and the worker being replicated to 10 nodes. All right. And I fell into a time warp. We have like five minutes less, and I still want to show logging and metrics, so I'm going to show that uh, quickly. Like, you've seen the main thing to, um, to deploy code. I'm going maybe to show like a rolling updates, like what if I want to change something in the code? Fine. And I'm going to change something a little bit different. I'm going to change something in... Um, like in the web UI, uh, where is, there is something to change the, yeah. Uh, I want to change the size of the labels in the web UI. So I change the font size in that code. And then I'm going to redo the three steps, like build, chip, and run. Um, so first, docker compose dash f docker coin cml build. And this was, again, pretty fast because of the caching mechanism. Then push, which was also pretty fast, again, because of the caching system. And then deploy. It's updating all the existing services. And if I go back here and I hit reload, OK, it's redeploying the web UI, so I have to wait, I think, 10 seconds. And now you can see that my thing is still here, and you can see that the, the size here is now much, much bigger. So it looks like I, I went fast here, but it's, it's not because I went fast, it's because it was fast, because I just had to change the code, and then build, push, stack deploy, and that's it. And um, I'm, I'm missing time to show about the rolling deploys, but if you do changes on the workers, with, uh, which are scaled to 10 instances, you can indicate um, uh, an update strategy. For instance, here in the, in the compost file, you can say, I want to update that service two instances at a time and I want to wait 10 seconds between updates. And in that case, it's instead of updating everything, like the 10 services, like bring everything down and bring the new versions up, it's going to take two versions, or two instances, excuse me, update them 
then it's going to wait 10 seconds, then it's going to take another pair of instances, update them, and so on, and so on, and so on. All right. Um, scope, this is pretty important. One of the things with the Docker API is that out of the box, it has no notion of users or anything like that. that it, it looks like it's uh, all or nothing. If you have access to the Docker API, you can mess up everything. So uh, it's like uh, the first thing is like, well, that seems really bad. How do we address that? Um, there are many ways to, to address that. The easiest thing, like if you want like the simplest solution, is you use separate clusters. So for instance, you say this is the production cluster. Only uh, the people that are on call or responsible for deployment have access to that cluster. This is the dev cluster. Everybody can do whatever they want. That simple solution. Another method is to add an extra layer of abstraction. Uh, for instance, if you are responsible for a big compute cluster in a research group, like let's say it's 1,000 nodes, and you're not super comfortable giving full API, full API access to the research teams, what you can do instead is like, well, uh, what most of you people want to do is to um, start 10,000 copies of one specific container because it's like massively parallel uh, computation. So I'm not, going, I'm not going to give you access to the full Docker API. I'm just going to give you a little web form where you can put an image name, how many copies you want, and submit, and that's it. And then on, on my side, I will sanitize that output, of course, and then I will do basically a Docker service create with the image name and the right number of replicas. And that way you can't do anything fancy and, and, and break the cluster. Now, if you want something better, uh, there is a mechanism in Docker called authorization plugins, uh, where you can have every single API request be vetted by an authorization plugin. And in that case, each time you do a, an, an API request, whatever it is, it's going to go through the plugin, and the plugin will be able to check uh, who you are according to the certificate you used when connecting to the API, and it's going to be able to use other information like labels existing on services uh, to indicate if you are allowed or not to carry with this operation. Uh, this is the, the framework that is used in UCP. Uh, UCP is Universal Control Plane. That's also one uh, commercial product of Docker. Um, the interesting bit there is that uh, this gives you like uh, enterprise compliant like management for containers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the interesting part is that it's not using some special proprietary way to add new features to the, uh, to the Docker API. Uh, UCP, so this web management portal, is an authorization plugin. So if you have like a Docker data center install, when you will do Docker service create blah, 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 it's going to check your certificate and like, okay, that's Bob or Barbara or whomever. Uh, they are in the dev team uh, and they are currently trying to create a service uh, on these nodes, but they don't have access to that. So it's going to be denied at the API level. And those plugins can be chained. So if you want to add your custom plugins, but keep existing plugins, you can absolutely do that as well. All right. Um, for logging and metrics, I'm just going to do the, the demo since we are out of time. Um, but what I want to highlight is that it's the same um, protocol, so to speak. So I have a a nil key stack, Elasticsearch logs dash Kibana, and I'm going to do docker compose dash f elk.yaml uh, build. Whoops. Ah, where did it go? Yeah, build, push. Build and push do nothing in that case because there is nothing to build and push, but I do it anyway. And then docker stack deploy elk dash c elk.yaml. Okay, and so this is creating my elk stack. And now if I go to my cluster on port 5601, I will get my um, uh, status yellow because it's still initializing. All right. Uh, so now this is running and if I here I have a docker coins plus glf uh, stack. 
which is the Docker coin stack, but using uh, the GLF plugin uh, to send the logs to a specific GLF receiver, receiver. So this is exactly the same stack as the Docker coin stack, but configured uh, to send logs to this cluster. So I'm going to do Docker stack deploy. Um, dial Docker coins dash C Docker coins plus GLF. It's going to restart the whole stack. And after a few seconds in Kibana, uh, let's see if I can remember how Kibana, yep. The logs that we see here are the logs of Docker coins, but flowing through the GLF logging driver, then going to Logstash. Uh, on Logstash, they are passed out, and then they are stored in Elasticsearch, and Kibana is displaying them. Um, and then I can search or do whatever I want. Um, the last demo involves metrics. How do I get metrics? Well, um, there is a system called Prometheus, which is, uh, it's called like cloud native, but there are some good reasons for that. And I am going to spin it up um, and, and explain why. So docker compose dash f prometheus.yml build. So why do we need a special uh, system for, for metrics? Like why can't we use cacti or, or something like that? Uh, because when you have containers, um, one of the characteristic things is that you often scale up or down, just like with VMs. Like if, if you've been using EC2 for a while, uh, you have auto-scaling groups and you create VMs, destroy VMs. So imagine when you have, let's say, the CPU metrics for a given VM, and now you scale down, so that VM does not exi ex exist anymore. What should we do with the, the metrics data for that VM? Should we keep it around? Uh, should we destroy it? What if you scale back up later, but now that VM doesn't have four CPUs but eight, like the, the metrics won't really make sense anymore? Um, so we need a metric system that is a little bit more evolved than the things that we had before. Uh, and now I'm going to docker stack deploy from Ethias dash C Prometheus YAML. And Prometheus will do that. The idea with Prometheus is that instead of thinking um, this is like the, the metrics data for the VM number 54 or for container number five, it's like I have a bunch of metrics data and I have labels uh, on, on, this, uh, on this data. Um, and so it's fine if at some point I have a, a hole in my data, instead of having the classic approach, which is I'm going to enumerate uh, all my containers. Oh, okay, I have 12 containers. Now I'm going to take the time series data for those 12 containers and do some aggregation. No, now we say I want all the time series data that match this specific query, and then I do the aggregation on that. Um, so, for instance, in Prometheus, here I can check in target. Yeah, everything is up and running. And here, um, that's where I have to copy paste the query. Uh, and I will do a very quick explanation of what this query stands for. Uh, execute. All right, graph. Um, and I, that's one part where I need, I think, to reshape a little bit the, um, the way I do this part of the workshop because we deploy the metric system and we immediately look at the metrics and so obviously there is very little data in it, so it's pretty hard to, to make a demo. But here, for instance, the metric that I've entered here um, means I want to um, look at the CPU usage for containers uh, but I want only to select the containers that belong to the service Docker Coins Worker. So I, I'm just interested by the CPU usage for Docker Coins Workers. Uh, then I'm doing like uh, that in one minute buckets. 
a, a computer rate because uh, CPU usage in metric systems is a little bit like an electricity meter. It's, it's like it's just a, a measure that goes up and up and up and up, so you have to do a, a difference over time to see exactly the, the usage in a way that we are familiar with, like, oh, 50%, 5%, etc. Then I'm doing an aggregation by node ID. So this means I want to see the CPU usage for my worker service, but node per node. I don't care if on one node there is like three workers, on another node there are like two workers, etc. Et I just want to make an aggregate of the CPU usage uh, for, uh, for, for each node for that specific service. Um, so if, you, if you've been using other metric system and you're wondering like, why the hell are we, do we need something like Prometheus? Uh, I invite you to kind of reflect, okay, how would I do a similar query with my metric system? I'm not saying it's not possible or anything like that, but uh, for me, that kind of request was the haha moment because I was thinking about like my um, traditional Munin or uh, cacti graphs and how would I get the equivalent thing, and it's not as simple as that. Um, all right, so... And I, if you wonder exactly how the query works, the slides explain like step by step exactly how, how to build that query. Um, that's pretty much all. Like there is something about stateful services, but we are out of time. I'm really sorry. I, I think I lost um, track of time at some point. I'm, so we are, I had to kind of go really quick over the last few chapters. Uh, I will stick around before running away for lunch if you have questions. Uh, let's see if I had things on that. Oh yeah, I still want to mention that about the stateful services question. Like if you were like, oh, but wait, I, I came just to learn how to run my database in containers. So I'm, I'm extremely disappointed. Um, the, the bottom line about how to run databases or data stores in, in containers, like should I really be doing that? Uh, depending whom you ask, some people will tell you, no, 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 you should not run uh, databases in containers. You should run them directly on the machines, which reminds me 10 years ago, people saying, no, 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 you can't run that in VMs. You have to run them on physical machines. Yeah, sure. Uh, some other people will tell you, oh, well, that's, that's funny. I mean, we've been running thousands of Postgres databases in production in containers for a few years. Are we doing anything wrong? Um, some people will ask you what's a container, but that's because you asked the wrong person. The, the right question for me is not, should I be running that in a container? The right question is, should I be running that full stop? What I mean is that, um, is this a service that is critical for my business? Like, if that thing goes down, um, if I say, oh, it, it went down because Amazon went down or because my third party provider went down, can you do that, or is it going to make you look really, really bad? Uh, if it's the search on your website, it's probably okay. If it's the core database and everything is down, eh, maybe not so much. Now, if, you're running, if you run it internally, can you do a better job than somebody else? That's also a good question, because now if, it, if, it, if it's down and you say, oh, it's because my sysadmins and DBAs are morons, that's not going to sound very good either. Uh, so you have to wonder, what's exactly my, my value add? Like, um, am I adding value to the thing because I'm running this database myself or not? Or should I find somebody who can do a better job to run that? And then if the final answer is yes, I really need to run that because my job is to run databases for people, then yes, you probably can get a lot of value from running that in containers. Because instead of managing 1,000 databases in VMs, you are going to manage 1,000 databases in containers, and you are going to be able to leverage the upset of containers. That's it. Uh, I have to remind you that there is a link where you can like submit feedback. I'm going to try to show that on screen. Uh, that's not very big enough. Uh, how can I put something big on screen? Uh, thanks a lot for your patience. Um, please give feedback and uh, have a wonderful conference. That's it. <laughs>
That doesn't work in, in between.